The heart of the inner sea's illicit drug trade, where until recently even human lives could be bought and sold freely, is a most curious country, ruled over by a secretive alien cabal. This week, I'm discussing the unique nation of Katapesh. The powerful and independent nation of Katapesh is separated from the ancient pharaonic kingdom of Osirian by the brazen peaks in the north, from the majocracy of Nex by the Alemian River in the south, and from the central Mwangi expanse by the Barrier Wall Mountains in the west. The power of modern Katapesh has been secured through its dedication to trade. Its bazaars are well known across Galarian, not just for their size, but for their incredible variety of wares. No item is too rare or too taboo to be found somewhere in the tents, shops, and wagons of the nation's many merchants. In Katapesh, those with the gold make the rules, and the only question that remains then is how much gold one needs to afford their desires. But it was not always so. For thousands of years, Katapesh was the home of simple nomadic desert tribes, and then came the Empire of Osirian, bringing with it the first settlements and the first written records. So let's wind back the clock and start our deep dive the way we always do, with the history of Katapesh. The Empire of Assyrian was founded in minus 3470, and its founding has been used by historians to mark the end of the Age of Anguish and the beginning of the Age of Destiny. The Age of Destiny is characterized by the re-emergence of humanity after the long, hard millennia of the Ages of Darkness and Anguish that followed the Earthfall Cataclysm. Under the rule of successive pharaohs, the land prospered and expanded. They spread west to occupy the lands of modern-day Thuvia, but also of great interest to the early pharaohs were the fertile lands south of the Alemian River, which the Assyrian people referred to as the Southern Reach. In order to reach these lands, however, the Empire of Assyrian had to cross the treacherous brazen peaks. Along the way, early Assyriani explorers established small settlements along the Pale River and along the coast. These settlements included the villages of Kelmarain, El Fatar, and Yavipo along the river, as well as Three Stars and Tivens Reed along the coast. They did not yet build a settlement at the mouth of the Scorpius River, despite its obvious strategic location, as according to legend, the river valley here was protected by a powerful sphinx that they could not displace. In any case, the Empire of Osirian established a long coastal road that skirted this protected valley, and then extended down to the Alemian. By minus 3,000, they had established the city of Quantium at the mouth of the Alemian further south. For thousands of years after this, the region currently known as Katapesh essentially served as a mercantile highway, ferrying the valuable produce and raw materials of the southern reach up to Assyrian, and ferrying back finished goods and luxuries back to the southern settlers. This is because the lands of Katapesh, beyond the coastline and the immediate environs of the Pale and Scorpius River, were treacherous even back then. Much of Katapesh is desert, and the few oases and slightly wetter hilllands were the domains of vicious knolls and pugwampis, or else the layers of drakes, wyverns, and manticores. Still, nomadic tribes of Badawi humans, Varanoi desert elves, and Shemtej catfolk had mastered the deserts in this time, mostly keeping to themselves, but also venturing into the Osiriani settlements along the rivers and coasts when they had goods to trade with the settled humans of Osirian. As discussed in my Geb and Nex videos, in minus 1125, Osirian entered into a six-year period of civil war. Although little changed for the empire's Katapeshi settlements, at the end of the war, in minus 1108, an exiled prince named Geb established a country in the most remote stretch of the southern reach. This began a decline period for the empire. Not long later, in minus 987, an archmage named Nex established his own country, breaking away the rest of the southern reach. In minus 842, Thuvia also separated from Osirian. The nations of Nex and Geb would ultimately enter into a devastating war with each other, which lasted from the year minus 892 to the year 576 AR. As the conflict in the southern reach killed much of its foreign trade, and as Osirian continued to decline economically, the city in Osirian's Katapeshi territories dwindled like untended fruits on the vine. As human settlers abandoned these territories in this period, a number of gnome settlers came to the region, especially to settle in the cities of Yavipo and Tivens Reed, and they effectively kept them going through the decline period. They also established the gnome town of Finderplain in the southern Katapeshi deserts as well. The Katapeshi territories, however, remained a part of the Empire of Assyrian throughout the entirety of the First and Second Ages. In fact, settled Katapesh remained a part of the Empire of Osirian all the way until the Osirianic Collapse of 1532. 
After a major slave revolt that year, the Padishah Empire of Kalesh conquered the entire country of Assyrian, launching their invasion from their western satrapy of Kadira. The Kalashite Empire had been founded in Kazmarin in the last years of the Age of Anguish, and its line of emperors had been unbroken since its founding. It had steadily grown in power and influence over the course of the Age of Destiny and Age of Enthronement, until it encompassed a half-dozen satrapies, each the size of a country in its own right. The conquest of Assyrian marked a significant victory for the empire, the most substantive expansion westwards since the conquest of Kadira in minus 43. The Kalashite conquest in 1532 was transformative for Katapesh. While Assyrian already had a large population in its major cities and ports, Katapesh's cities had been dwindling, as previously mentioned. Kalesh interest in both the region and with Nexian trade renewed investment in the Katapeshi cities. Kalashites emigrated in large numbers to the Katapeshi settlements, and they brought with them their culture and religion. The Saronite faith spread quickly across the land. The Kalesh practices of genie binding and the use of wishcraft to rapidly expand the cities and to build elaborate structures and buildings was also brought to the territory. Kitaj catfolk from the deserts of central Kazmarin also came to settle in the territory along with the land's native Shemtej. It's worth noting that the conquest of Assyrian was not simply imperialism, it was all in service of the growing conflict between the Kelishite Empire and its northern rival, the Empire of Taldor. In 2080, as discussed in my recent Andoran and Central Mwangi deep dive videos, the Taldan Empire retaliated by establishing a beachhead in these lands. Taldor conquered the southern reaches of modern Katapesh, along the border with Nex, claiming not just a vast stretch of the Katapesh Desert, but also the entire northern banks of the Alemian River, leading all the way to the vital Nadele Gap, connecting eastern Garand and the Mwangi Expanse. Before the Empire of Kalesh could mount a significant defense against this incursion, Taldor's large army was wiped out by another unexpected force, the forces of the guerrilla king of the Mwangi Expanse. Thereafter, Kalashite armies wasted no time in reclaiming the Taldan conquered lands. Meanwhile, the Saronite faith that had come with the Kalashite Empire had also been spreading rapidly in the Osirian mainland to the north. Though the faith was flourishing, it was occasionally coming into conflict with the local Osiriani faiths. See my Osirian Pantheon religion video for more details on the religious practices of the people before the coming of the Kalashites. In the middle of these struggles, specifically in 2217, a militant Saronite group emerged, called the Cult of the Dawnflower, setting fire to Pharaonic temples and vandalizing Osiriani artifacts. Although the ruling satraps were obviously pro Saronre as a group, the destabilizing nature of this sect caused the satraps to exile the cult's leadership. The cult was banished from Sothis and the Osirian heartland. Some traveled west to Thuvia, but others traveled south, beyond the Brazen Peaks. Led by a devout priestess named Vedi, these Saronites would establish a place they would call Saronre's Bastion in the remote southern reaches of the Barrier Wall Mountains. Despite its harsh environs, in time this settlement would come to be known as the city of Solku, the second largest city in the region. This militant Saronite order would eventually face internal discord of its own, as some members would begin to doubt Vedi's leadership. A splinter group abandoned Solku to seek out more fertile lands and find a more practical place to live than among the arid southern mountains. They reached the mouth of the Scorpius River, and according to their writings, this splinter faction of Saronite pilgrims was admitted to settle there by the valley's aforementioned Sphinx Protector. These pilgrims audaciously named their new home in the fertile river valley the Golden City. For a while, the Golden City grew rapidly, drawing interest from various settlers of all races and backgrounds, including a large number of Palmet dwarves from the north. Even while all this was going on in the territory that would become Katapesh, a growing schism had also emerged between the satrap of occupied Osirian and the Padishah Empire, a schism which had in fact been exacerbated by the exile of Saronites to other lands. In 2253, the satrap was found dead in his palace, and a sunflower, one of the symbols of the cult of the dawnflower, had been placed in his mouth. For the heirs of the satrap, this was the last straw, as being a member satrapy of the Kalashite Empire was providing neither the security nor the political or economic value it once had. The satrap's successor named himself an independent sultan, and Osirian became an independent sultanate, ruled by a Kaleshi sultan starting in 2253. The greater empire of Kalesh lacked the resources in that time for a proper reprisal, and the separation happened more or less without further incident. The lands of Katapesh were naturally retained as part of the new Sultanate of Osirian. 
A little later in Katapesh, in 2589, during what is now called the Year of Scouring Winds, tragedy struck the new golden city at the mouth of the Scorpius. A sandstorm lasting 33 days destroyed almost all plant life in the Golden City's valley, killing hundreds and nearly burying the city itself. Most fled, many to Solku, where priests proclaimed the sandstorm to be a judgment against the city's undevout populace. From 2689 to 2692, however, a mysterious Badawi woman named Nimar walked out of the desert and began clearing the ruins of the Golden City. Others joined her in her task. By the end of this period, the city was resettled, and Nimar and her followers renamed the city Sandstar. Now no longer a strictly Saranite city, explorers, alchemists, and researchers flock to it, though their presence and growing wealth also served to ignite banditry in the area, especially among the land's indigenous knoll population. Nimar remained with the city, becoming the new Muhafiz, or governor. In 3249, an alchemist named Atoru discovered the cacti growing near Sandstar had mutated since the year of scouring winds. Atoru's experiments on the cactus produced a narcotic substance he called pesh. By the following year, the sale and use of pesh had spread across the land and abroad, drawing criminals and merchants of all kinds to the city. Muhafiz Nimar was still alive at this time, now having been governor of Sandstar for 37 years already. The elderly Muhafiz was assassinated by a leader among the city's growing bandit population. This bandit was named Jadai, and over the course of the next few years, he wrested control of the Golden City from the alchemist lords that had acquired power under Nimar's reign. He renamed the Golden City once again, this time naming it Katapesh, for it was the heart of the Pesh trade. By the end of 3250, mercenary armies in the pay of Jedi and his allies established what they considered Greater Katapesh. Katapesh City was named the capital of this new nation-state, and all the lands from the Brazen Peaks to the Elemian River broke free from the Sultanate of Osirian. Jedi took the position of Merchant King of Katapesh, which he held for just over 12 years. The town of Solku remained independent from the rest of the nation for a while after this. From 3256 to 3257, Knoll slavers began raiding Solku, and for two relentless years the Knoll raiders sold slaves from independent Solku to Katapesh. The result of these raids not only eventually led to the incorporation of Solku into the Katapeshi state, but also led to the erosion of control that the cult of the Dawnflower had over the city, as many citizens of Solku began to feel betrayed and abandoned by their goddess. After Jedi's death in 3262, a succession of various bandit warlords seized the title of Merchant King of Katapesh for themselves. Not many were able to hold power for more than a few years at a time, and despite the high value of the Pesh trade, the lords of Katapesh were unable to control the flow of wealth from one bandit group to another, and it became an increasingly lawless and unsafe place. One new major city did emerge in this wild period. In 3496, the slaver captain Ilmatis Okeno declared herself the first pirate lord of Port Okeno. The makeshift port originally began as a convenient place for pirates to stop by to collect water and provisions without relying on the well-surveilled ports of the mainland. But Captain Okeno encouraged other pirates to convene there to create a convenient center for their more illicit businesses. Captain Okeno ruled the port city for over a decade, but she was killed when she tried to unite several other slaver groups under her flag. For 300 years after her death, Okeno continued to serve as a pirate port without centralized leadership, despite various attempts to unify the pirates under a single banner. Then in 3725, something remarkable happened. An alliance of creatures of otherworldly alien origin arrived, possibly by starship or maybe by some other magical means. These aliens, a breed of witch-weirds, numbered five in total, arriving about 10,000 years ago. Their sudden appearance in 3725 is widely speculated upon, but the prevailing theory among experts is that they simply recognized in lawless Katapesh a good place to seize power and establish a thriving mercantile empire of their own. Some say they marched into the city by night at the head of an army of highly disciplined soldiers and simply crushed the leaders of the various bandit gangs occupying the city before any form of resistance could be organized. Others say the Pact Masters arrived in airships that so utterly terrified the city's bandit lords they fled into the deserts and never returned. In truth, there is no actual record documenting exactly what happened, as the five Pact Masters have had all records of their arrival carefully scrubbed. They have since quietly ruled the city and country from their palace, away from the public eye and inquiring minds. 
though perhaps the truth of their arrival to Catapesh may be hidden somewhere between the various tales exchanged by the common folk of the land. Despite the aliens having access to advanced technologies from across the stars, very few of these have been introduced into Catapesh, and where they have been positioned they have been deployed carefully and with strict oversight. The most prominent example of which we are technology being adapted to enforce law in Catapesh is the creation of the Alums, Discussed in more detail in my construct creature feature, the alums are skull-faced automaton-like constructs that house a real living soul. They are a slave form of construct, however, typically containing the soul of a retired member of the Zephyr Guard who has been offered immortality in exchange for a life of service in defense of the order of the Pact Masters. Special pendants called charms of alum control guarantee the loyalty of these alum constructs. The Pact Masters brought a necessary degree of law and order to the lawless lands of Catapesh. They continued to exploit both the trade of Pesh and slaves to drive their wealth, however. In fact, they adopted an anything-goes policy when it came to trade in general, but with stricter enforcement on banditry, theft, and murder, they were able to turn Catapesh from a lawless land to the beating heart of a thriving mercantile empire. By 3730, the city of Catapesh expanded its grand bazaar and opened its infamous night markets, where anything at all could be bought and sold. And by 3750, the city had expanded to include a greater set of outer walls, built on a scale unlike anything seen outside of the powerful majocracy of Nex to the south. Naturally, not everyone embraced this anarcho-capitalist alien regime. In 4112, a new order of paladins of Sarenrae emerged in Solku to combat regional slavery, and soon they began to perform covert raids out of Solku to free all slaves held or being sold in Catapesh. They initially had only moderate success against the growing power of the Pact Masters, and many of their order were in turn captured and enslaved by the Alums and the Zephyr Guard. Around this time, an Ifrit prince from the elemental plane of fire came to Catapesh as well. Prince Javul, he was called, and he was a servant to Queen Imeri, elemental queen of the plane of fire, who is discussed in more detail in my elemental planes video. In an effort to impress his queen, Prince Javul began to excavate the remains of a powerful spawn of Rovagug that had been buried in the Brazen Peaks in the early years of the Age of Destiny. In the course of his excavation, Javul became the ruler of a temple devoted to Rovagug, a place that is now known as the House of the Beast. Javul's dark works in the region partially fractured reality, and this attracted the attention of a Jathun princess named Nefeshti. She led a party of heroes from the elemental plane of Air, a group known as the Templars of the Five Winds, to face Javul and his minions. Javul, supported by the cult of Rovagag and Nefeshti, accompanied by the Templars of the Five Winds, faced off against each other in the shadow of the Pale Mountain in northern Catapesh. This took place in the year 4300. Although Nefeshti was unable to kill Javul, she was able to banish him to a forgotten demiplane called Kakishan, once used as a magical retreat by the powerful Archmage Nex. Javul would remain bound there for almost 400 years, but the work he had begun in the Pale Mountain lingered unfinished, awaiting either his return or for one of his surviving disciples to pick up his work. In 4606, Katapesh remained relatively unaffected by the global disruption of the Death of Prophecy. In 4701, Knowles from the White Canyon, led by Chieftain Wrath Sandstalker, besieged Sulku. Paladins of Iomade arrived to reinforce their Saranite allies. The siege broke, but the Paladins of Iomade mostly perished in the Battle of Red Hail. In 4705, the Grey Corsairs, a small navy made up of Andorran freedom fighters, sank three Katapeshi slave galleys. The Pact Masters began to offer large rewards for the destruction of the Corsairs' fleet. In 4709, the Ifrit Prince Javul would escape his extraplanar confinement and attempt to complete his work to resurrect the spawn of Rovagug near the Pale Mountain. The exact details of this return are played out in the first edition Legacy of Fire Adventure Path. By 4710, anti-slavery operations conducted by such activists as the Solku Paladins of Sarenrae meant that a significant number of enslaved individuals had managed to escape. Most fled into the remote regions of Catapesh. Beyond the bustling bazaars, they found shelter, anonymity, and employment among the Badawi villagers and nomads of the Catapeshi deserts. In these hinterlands, a group of former slaves developed their own pesh paste as a natural stimulant that could in fact help combat the devastating effects of refined pesh addiction. With a profit from pesh paste, they aimed to expand their pesh cultivation sites and assist more enslaved Catapeshi in escaping to rural villages. The plan met with success. But the introduction of this alternative form of pesh into the market began to attract the attention of the Pact Masters. 
By 4720, the Pact Masters had dispatched bands of mercenaries into Badawi territories to seize their pesh crops. However, in a surprising turn of events, the Badawi villagers and their allies emerged victorious in the initial skirmishes. The Badawi Pesh Growers Guild declared their alliance with the Firebrands faction, an anti-slavery faction that had emerged in Western Garen some years prior. Other Firebrand allies came to Katapesh to reinforce the Growers Guild. Fearing a disastrous and bloody uprising, the Badawi Revolution was abruptly halted when the Pact Masters agreed to key terms. In 4722, they marked the end of legalized slavery in the nation, with a further tacit agreement allowing the Badawi Growers Guild to continue selling their new pesh in the common market. This brings us to today. These recent events have compelled the Pact Masters to take a more direct role in governance than they have had to take in the last 10,000 years. The sudden emergence of pesh paste, followed by the Badawi Revolt, left them struggling for control for the first time since their mysterious arrival. The Pact Master's leading human liaison, Pact Broker Hashim Ibn Said, has offered deep reassurances to Katapesh's various guild masters that the Pact Masters have the situation under control, but some groups are beginning to advocate for a coup. To protect their interests, the Pact Masters have been cultivating a deeper relation with Katapesh's knolls, including the establishment of the first ever knoll battalion of the Zephyr Guard. With this sudden influx of military strength, the Pact Masters are likely to be able to hold down control. Regardless, the civil unrest has marked the first time outsiders are questioning the stability of the Pact Master regime, and therefore the consequences for Katapesh's political standing abroad are more precarious than ever before. What this means for the dark markets of Katapesh, only time will tell. The Government of Katapesh As touched on in my history section, Katapesh is governed by an enigmatic organization of rarely seen, robed and masked aliens known as the Pact Masters. The circumstances of their arrival in 3725 are shrouded in mystery, but for a thousand years they have remained the undisputed masters of the country. Regardless of their origins, the Pact Masters, Angrul, Jivnar, Krimiltuk, Morvithus, and Zandarkhan, rule the city quietly from their palace, avoiding public scrutiny. Their edicts are conferred to the populace via their chief servant, Pact Broker Hashim Ibn Said, who oversees day-to-day -day governance on behalf of the Pact Masters, responsible for upholding their judgments and laws. While speculation persists about Ibn Said harboring a personal agenda, he currently enjoys a stable and respected position. Ibn Said also presides over the Merchant Council, responsible for trade policies and market regulation, but he tends to adopt a more laissez-faire approach to any matters outside the sphere of commerce. The fact is, the entire country primarily revolves around commerce, ensuring a constant and smooth flow of business. Guilds play a crucial role here, and individuals are free to engage in trade as long as they belong to the relevant guild. Merchant guild membership is typically cheap, but often comes with strict observances, and neglecting tax obligations results in harsh guild retribution. Monthly councils between the Pact Masters and Guild Masters are conducted to arbitrate disputes, approve fee schedules, and administer punishments for violating trade laws. Theft is severely punished, with first-time offenders losing a hand and facing branding, while second-time offenders are executed on the spot by the Zephyr Guard. Other crimes are typically met with fines, or sometimes even overlooked if they don't directly hinder commerce. Destruction of property, however, is a serious crime, resulting in forfeiture of an item of equal value, Despite the Pact Masters rarely being seen, their extensive network of spies and the vigilant Zephyr Guard ensures they are aware of all occurrences within Katapesh. The Zephyr Guard are further reinforced by the Alums, powerful golems strategically placed throughout the city and country to maintain order. The Katapesh Gazetteer Katapesh can be divided into five major territories. The Uwaga Highlands, Centered around the Pale Mountain, which rises like a great grey spike of granite above the surrounding hills and crags of both the eastern barrier wall and the jagged brazen peaks, are the Uwaga Highlands. Occupying the northwest region of Katapesh, this territory was the site of the popular first edition adventure path, Legacy of Fire. The River Valleys The Pale and Scorpius Rivers provide Katapesh with its only stretch of fertile land. Most of the country's population lives along this stretch, with the vast, vast majority of the nation's population to be found in the city of Katapesh itself. Stonespine and the North Coast Stonespine Island and its surrounding islets, along with the treacherous shoreline of Katapesh's north coast, are notorious pirate territory. The residents here often don't even consider themselves to be a part of the Katapesh state, and tend to follow their own laws and rules. The Southern Barrier Wall 
Centred around the city of Solku, the southern barrier wall territory comprises various deep mountain regions, treacherous dry hilllands, and at its southeastern reach, a stretch of deep murky swampland. Despite being remote, it's not free from commerce. Katapesh's second largest city of Solku is connected with the Nexian city of Anopian to the south by the famous Nexian road called the Barapara Uchafru, or the Road of Dirt. The Katapesh Desert. The southeastern corner of the country is mostly desert. Along the coast, the Barapara Damnu, or the Road of Blood, connects the Nexian capital of Quantium with a few cities along this stretch of desert and ultimately to the capital city of Katapesh. Today, this region has grown in significance, as it is here that the Badawi Growers Guild grow their new pesh paste. The Uwaga Highlands The northwestern highlands of Katapesh serve as a natural barrier separating the nation's heartland from its neighboring regions, Assyrian to the north and the Mwangi expanse to the west. These peaks also play a crucial role in isolating Katapesh from the abundant western rainfall that nourishes the lush Mwangi expanse. Here, precipitation is confined to high mountain lakes and snow-capped peaks, later coursing through deep-cut canyons during the spring thaw, nourishing the Pale River. In contrast to the bustling cities along the coast, the highlands present a wilder environment, a frontier inhabited by resilient individuals who sustain themselves in spite of the land rather than because of it. This region is characterized by untamed wilderness and formidable creatures, including barbaric knoll tribes and hungry manticores. While the laws of Katapesh nominally extend to the highlands, the influence of the Pact Masters is rarely felt here. They are accustomed to solitude, forging their own path, and cultivating a spirit of independence that borders on stubbornness. Important locations in the Uwaga Highlands include the Painted Flutes. On the far western edge of the Uwaga Highlands rests a vast canyon filled with pillars of colored rock. These totem-like formations carved by wind fill this canyon, with whistling sounds as the strong winds grind away at the hoodoos and refine their eerie, elegant forms. When the winds reach the right speed, the natural music here turns hauntingly beautiful. No mortal composed the songs the hoodoos play, and every time they sing, the tune is different. Dedicated musicians sometimes travel to the painted flutes to listen to the eerie moans and whistles of the wind sawing at the rocks and gather inspiration for their own work. These windy valleys have also attracted a number of air elementals and Jathum air genies who have made homes for themselves in the deep canyons here. The Western Valleys Between the Painted Flutes and the Pale Mountain Territory, there lies a series of valleys and canyons, a collection of lowlands between one cluster of mountains in the east and one in the west. These reach as far north as the Gem Basket, a location discussed in more detail in my Central Mwangi Expanse video, and as far south as the Southern Barrier Hilllands and Fort Longjaw. The major valleys and canyons here include the Litha Vale, the Serpent's Canyon, and the Nauru's Vale. The northmost valley is the Litha Vale, which was once lush and fertile, carrying some of the moisture of the Mwangi expanse to the west, and was tended by a dedicated grove of druids. Unfortunately, the Litha Vale fell under a curse, which turned its high druid, the priestess Orlas, into a Medusa. The valley now houses creatures of living stone, who are slavishly loyal to their dark mistress. Immediately south of the Litha Vale is another wide canyon that spans the Brazen Peaks, known as Serpent's Canyon. It was once a significant pass, but is now frequented less often by civilized travelers, due in part to the corruption of the Litha Vale in the north, but also due to increased knoll activity. Nomads now only cautiously traverse it, wary of its many potential dangers. On the south side of the Serpent's Canyon lies another gently wooded vale. This is the Nauru's Vale, guarded by the survivors of the Litha Vale Druids. This circle of druids still seeks to break the curse on their former home. The Medusa Orlas's power is still too great to challenge, however, and so the druids have focused on defending their new haven and preserving its natural state until such a time as they can formulate a plan to defeat or break the curse on Orlas. The Northern Cascade On the northern edge of the Uwaga Highlands, close to the border with Osirian, lies a beautiful pair of lakes, Lake Vorn and Lake Fors, which are fed by a high waterfall known as the Northern Cascade. This cascade is fed by melting snows from the high brazen peaks, which flood directly into the broad Lake Vorn, before cascading down a series of smaller falls known as the Viper's Tongue to reach Lake Fours, which lies on a tiered step below it. The northern cascade, as it is known, is a natural wonder, but of little interest to the inhabitants of the brazen peaks beyond that, since the land around the lakes is rocky and rugged, the peaks high, and the trails difficult even in good weather. Furthermore, Lake Vorn is rumored to be the home of a monstrous sea creature called the Vorndra, a creature that reputedly devours intruders who linger too long in its territory. Skeptics claim no waterborne creature of any great size could live in Lake Vorn, as there is not enough food in the lake to sustain it, 
nor any means for it to leave to hunt elsewhere, but the tale persists, with descriptions of Vorndra ranging from draconic and serpentine to tentacled or beaked. Some have even found what appears to be the remains of crude altars and offerings on the pebbled lake shore, perhaps indicating some mysterious worship of the lake monster itself. The Ruins of Maradshar the ruins of the great temple complex of Marichar, its proud columns toppled and its statues of strange beings disfigured by the scouring winds, lies in a deep canyon shadowed by the surrounding mountains. Those who have explored the ancient temple have reported that at the heart of the ruins stands a great crumbling gateway bearing the image of a sphinx-like creature, and beyond that a sixty-three-foot-tall pillar sculpted so that it appears to be made of a great many petrified humans. Explorers have taken to calling it the Sacrament of the Faithless, the nomads of the region refuse to even speak of Maradshar, and none can say what strange faith was once worshipped here. Further study has been deterred by the canyon's protectors, a sizable pride of ravening, unnatural lions, each bearing black, soulless eyes, and the uncanny ability to speak a strange, guttural tongue. The Brazen Trail Lying some ways to the east of the ruins of Maradshar lies the Brazen Trail. The Brazen Trail is a Highlands caravan trail that traverses the Brazen Peaks along some well-worn roads, skirting around various mountains to avoid the peak's frosty upper reaches. The road connects the Katapeshi settlements of Bronzehook, Kelmoraine, and Thricehall with the Osiriani settlements of Safani and Ipek. The trail is worked only by the most experienced caravanners, men and women that are familiar with the terrain and territory and know how to ward off knoll raids and wyvern attacks. The trail also crosses a number of prominent landmarks. About 15 miles north of Bronze Hook along the old trade route lie two freshwater lakes resembling footprints. These are called the Giant Steps, and the lakes have been rumoured to be sites of buried treasure, though the authenticity of these claims is questionable, as the caravanners here are fond of telling tall tales. Only five or ten miles north-northwest of the Giant Steps are the plains of Yemos, a plain of tall grasses that line the slopes just south of the Brazen Peaks. Notably, along this stretch of the highlands, there can be found a 40-foot-tall date tree which towers above the surrounding hillands. Allegedly, this tree grew from the corpse of the legendary Osiriani hero Jonafar Afalet, who died here fighting a mighty red dragon. Druids and other primal spellcasters who have made this trek report that the tree communicates with those who have the ability to speak with plants, and that it has a long memory, dating back many centuries. On the Osirian side, the trail also passes by the old Palmet dwarf necropolis of Erechrus, described in more detail in my Osirian deep dive video, and skirts around the treacherous knoll burial ground known as the Bone Garden, where undead knolls are known to wander. Finally, it reaches the relative safety of the Crook River and the various Osirian settlements that lie along those waters. The Silver Tarn Just south of the ruins of Marichar lies the Silver Tarn. This high mountain lake is named for both its still, reflective waters and for the old silver mines in the surrounding area, which have left several abandoned tunnels that can still be found cut into the mountains around the Tarn. The original excavations looked dwarven, and were likely the work of miners from the Hammer Falls further south. The deeper portions of the mines might even still be viable, but few prospectors have dared to brave the hazards of the brazen peaks to investigate. The Pale Mountain and the House of the Beast Revered and feared, and among the tallest mountains of the Brazen Peaks, the severely sloped Pale Mountain rises to a height of over 13,500 feet. The mountain's composition of speckled granite gives it a distinctly lighter color than the surrounding peaks. Although the rock that comprises the peak can be found throughout the area, the unusual concentration found in Pale Mountain has long baffled miners. The folklore of the superstitious knolls of the region explain the mystery in a variety of ways, with many claiming that the mountain is comprised of the bones of a titanic monstrosity that once ravaged the area. Possibly true, given the presence of the House of the Beast along its western slopes. As described in my history section, the House of the Beast was first constructed by a power-mad ifrit named Javul, but he was banished by the Templars of the Five Winds and the Princess Nefeshti. In his absence, the cults of Rovagug claimed dominion over the House of the Beast. These cults comprised predominantly of gnolls and troglodytes. The greatest among them was a gnoll warlord named the Carrion King, who was eventually resurrected as a morgue, see my undead deep dive video for more details on this creature type, and continued to hold power here even after his own death. The story of Javul and the House of the Beast features prominently in the Legacy of Fire adventure path. The Halls of Hammerfall West of the Pale Mountain lie the Hammerfalls, Fed by melting snow, these majestic falls cascade down from the mountains, roaring over tall cliffs and foaming through tiers of rapids down towards the Pale River, where the swirling white waters calm somewhat before flowing past Kelmoraine and the open plains. 
The largest of the falls is known as the Anvil, near the river's headwaters deep in the mountains, cascading over a plunge of more than 150 feet to a broad pool below. Long ago, the rock face behind and around the Anvil was riddled with natural caves worn by millennia of water, expanded and enlarged by dwarven stonemasons. The Halls of Hammerfall were once a significant dwarf community, certainly the largest such community in the lands of Catapesh, with a far-reaching trade network that connected them with the Palmet dwarves of Assyrian in the north and with mighty Dongan Hold in the south. Unfortunately, the Hammerfall dwarves disappeared several centuries ago, making them all but a legend to the shorter-lived races of the highlands. Many tales try to explain their fate, whether falling to a mysterious ailment or dying upon the blades of cruel knolls, but none know their fate for certain. The halls of Hammerfall have remained lost and sealed for generations. From time to time a daring prospector brags of maps showing hidden trails or secret entrances, or even claims to have been there and back, perhaps with a small bauble to prove the tale. But if anyone has truly found the old dwarven halls or learned their fate, they have successfully kept it to themselves. The Onyx Hall Tucked away on the shore of the Shadismere, the base of a spur of the highlands, is the old manor of Onyx Hall, sheltered by overgrown poplar and hemlock and surrounded by brambles. The hall, made of slate, dark granite, and marble, was once owned by a wealthy Salku family as a retreat house situated far from the bustle and intrigue of city life. Much of the family's wealth was accumulated through the slave trade, and legend has it that a woman in the highlands placed a curse upon the family after she, her husband, and their children were sold to separate owners in distant lands, never to see each other again. Ever since that time, over two hundred years now, Onyx Hall has stood abandoned, but not uninhabited, they say. Those lured to the manor by tales of the fabulous heirlooms accumulated there have never returned, slain by some nameless horror, so other treasure-seekers have become increasingly rare. The Pale River Originating from the high snowmelts of the Pale Mountain, the Pale River runs through deep canyons and cascades towards the lowlands, meeting with the Hammer Falls before flowing out of the mountains near Kelmoraine, passing Bronzehook, Thrice Hall, and Yavipo before cutting across the plains and meeting the Scorpius and then finally from there, flowing out into the Ubari at the great city of Katapesh. While the river is not overly wide, it is fast-flowing and sometimes surprisingly deep and cold, especially in the springtime when it swells with fresh-melted snows from the peaks, giving it foamy whitecaps and leading some to nickname it the Ale River. Kelmoraine Kelmoraine is one of the many small towns and villages that can be found along the Pale River part of the connective tissue that allowed the Empire of Osirian to maintain a thriving trade route with the Southern Reach during the days of the Old Empire. Kelmoraine was the village closest to the headwaters of the Pale, and therefore also the closest to the Pale Mountain. Unfortunately, like many of the small towns along the Pale, it came under hard times during the Osirian decline period, and under even harder times after the Pesh trade brought about Katapeshi independence, and the then Kaleshi sultans of occupied Osirian broke ties with them altogether. For Kelmoraine, things came to a head in 4689. At that time, Kelmoraine was in the grip of a terrible plague, and the town's elder priest of Sarenray, a man named Halrun, sought aid from a traveling seer named Zalthos. Zalthos was in fact the disciple of the demons of Abaddon, particularly Zuriel, the horseman of war, and his magical influence turned the surviving townsfolk against each other. Halrun eventually had Zalthos bound in the crypt beneath the temple, but by then it was too late for the town. So in a fit of guilt, Halrun took his own life by drinking poison. Of course, news of the town's destruction drew the attention of Katapesh's elusive and ruling pact masters, who had long overlooked the well-being of the people of the Uwaga Highlands. Desiring to bring the abandoned village of Kelmoraine back into the economic fold, and fearing it might fall into the hands of the dangerous denizens of the northern wilds, in 4709 they dispatched a merchant princess from a prominent mercantile family named Alma Raveshki with a caravan of settlers paid to rebuild and re-establish the town. When Alma arrived, she enlisted the aid of a band of heroes, as detailed in the Legacy of Fire adventure path, to wrest control of the village from the Kaldis Knoll tribe. Kelmoraine's troubles didn't end there, of course, as the Ifrit Prince Javul escaped his exile in this adventure path, bringing with him an army of evil genies to besiege the town, brought there by a strange brass tower that burst from the village's battle market like a malignant plant. The same group of heroes once again liberated Kelmoraine and likely saved the life of Alma, now serving as the town's muhafiz. 
Second edition sources don't specify what has happened to Kelmarine since that time, but it's entirely likely that Alma is still the town governor, and that if the PCs of that adventure ultimately settle there, bringing with them vast wealth from the city of Brass, where their adventure ultimately took them, that Kelmarine has since evolved to become a cultural centre for the entire Uwaga Highlands region. Bronze Hook Southeast of Kelmarine lies the town of Bronze Hook. Located at the head of the Katapeshi side of the Brazen Trail, which connects the Uwaga Highlands with the Assyriani city of Ipek, the townsfolk of Bronze Hook earned a healthy living ferrying goods and passengers across the Pale River and charging tolls for the use of the Hook Ford. As the old trade route fell into disuse, though, so too did the fortunes of Bronze Hook. The town continued to subsist of what little trade trickled through the old road, but desperate times called for desperate measures, so Bronze Hook increasingly asked no questions about trade passing through the town or along the river. This included slavers of various sorts and their miserable cargoes, exotic creatures, and things coming out of the Bronze Peaks. The constabulary has always been hard-pressed to keep order in this town, especially when a substantial number of visitors pass through, bringing with them coin and opportunities to drink and brawl in the local taprooms. That the authorities are often on the take, and more likely to be found starting brawls than breaking them, doesn't help either. Thrice Hill The young farming and trading town of Thrice Hill can be found in a shallow valley between its three namesake hills on the edge of the Katapeshi Plain, where the flow of the Pale River waters the grasslands to the east and south. Thrice Hill is home to fewer than seventy humans and halflings, and is known for its olives which flourish in the groves along the hills. The small community grows much of its own produce, shipping the rest along the Pale River to buyers, mainly eastwards towards the heartland of Katapesh. The town's humble successes in the twelve years since its founding have made it a soft and potentially tempting target for raiders, and its people are becoming more aware of it. The town has a central palisade which is defensible, but it's small, outdated, and poorly maintained, manned only by a few untested guardsmen. The people of Thrice Hill seek competent defenders, knowing it's only a matter of time before they must defend all they've created. White Canyon. Snaking through the heart of the Bronze Peaks, this deep canyon was cut by ancient mountain streams that have since dried up altogether, leaving a narrow gorge surrounded by high, windswept cliffs. Only small scrub and spiky grass grow in the clefts of the rocks, and the base of the canyon is covered with rocky, glittering sand. The shadows are deep here, which shoots its various inhabitants quite well. Knoll tribes have controlled White Canyon for some time, largely keeping to their domain and the surrounding areas just south of the mountains, so travellers and nomads of the highlands alike know that going to White Canyon means almost certain capture and enslavement. The River Valleys The lands around the Pale and Scorpius River represent the most fertile territories of Katapesh, and consequently their most densely populated areas. The Greater Valley's territory is considered to stretch as far west as the Barrier Wall Hills, as far south as Floater's Pond and the Sparadin Jungle, and as far north as the Brazen Peaks and the Fang and Sepet Passes. Important locations in the Katapeshi River Valleys include Pyre Crest. Not far from the Fang Pass, a solitary mountain scarred by volcanic eruptions can be found, a desolate peak with no signs of scrub or brush on its scorched slopes. The hardened tracks of magma, resembling veins of pitch, trace the contours of this now dormant volcano. This is Pyre Crest, and its foreboding visage harbors genuine perils for those daring to venture into its heights. A community of Ifrit genies from the elemental plane of fire have made their homes here going back over two centuries. Amir Etemad is purported to be the leader of this group, but the exact nature of their purpose here remains shrouded in mystery, as the Ifrit here seldom venture beyond their lair. They do fiercely repel any who approach, however, and in recent years they emerge from their volcanic stronghold to engage in a battle with a company of Jathum air genies, wiping out a merchant caravan that was unfortunate enough to be using the pass when the battle commenced. The Fang and Sepet Passes Two passes that allow for the transport of good between Osirian and Katapesh can be found in the Katapeshi River Valley territories. The widest pass in the Brazen Peaks is the Fang Pass, but it is also among the least trafficked and most treacherous. It does, however, connect the Katapeshi village of Yavipo with the city of Ipek in Osirian. While relatively safe on the Katapeshi side, on the Osirian side it leads directly into the South Desert, and crossing that desert requires the aid of skilled desert nomads who know the lands and dunes well. Furthermore, there are dangers on both sides of the passes, the Ifrit of Pyre Crest on one side, as just discussed, and the knolls of Fort Fang on the other side. Fort Fang is a significant knoll enclave, discussed in more detail in my Osirian deep dive video. For this reason, even though it's a narrower pass, most prefer to make use of the Sepet, a little further east. 
On the south side of the Sepet Pass, the headwaters of the Scorpius River can be found, while on the north side, the source of the Asp can be found. Travelers can make a short and difficult trek through the pass, but remain relatively close to clean drinking waters at all time. This pass also effectively connects the substantial Assyriani city of Wati in the north with both Katapesh city and El Fatar in the south. At the top of the pass, the hostile Sepet on the Assyriani side provides a safe place for travelers to rest and resupply. Yavipo. The village of Yavipo is a small settlement located near an oasis north of the Pale River. Its foundations were established in the middle years of Assyrians' first age, strategically located near an oasis that could be used as a stopover for merchants using the Fang Pass. In fact, it continues to serve as a place where one can sell almost anything to its curious inhabitants. However, it shrank substantially when trade with the southern reach of Assyrian dried up during the decline period between the First and Second Age, and especially later when the next Geb War made trade with the southern lands less and less valuable. Eventually, the settlement's original human inhabitants mostly moved on, and Yavipo became one of a few Katapeshi villages with a predominantly gnome population. More recently still, constant harassment by Noel raiders eventually forced the gnomes to migrate beneath the oasis, where homes and workshops were dug into the rock beneath the pool itself. Most dwellings have secret escape routes, and the settlement is carefully monitored by guards for fear of discovery from hostile outsiders. Few visitors are accepted into the community, and those select few are searched thoroughly before being allowed entry. A little paranoia, as they say in Yavapo, is a small price to pay for the feeling of security. The inhabitants of Yavapo these days are also motivated to remain in the area, despite its dangers and remote location, for the potent quality of the pesh that grows here. The underground labs of Yavipo churn out high-quality popesh, a product in high demand in Katapesh markets, and a number of gnome alchemists of Yavipo have lucrative trade arrangements with several dealers. The Crouching Jackal In the arid expanse of Katapesh's northern desert, a colossal stone figure rests in the sands, slowly weathered by the ceaseless passage of time. Standing nearly 70 feet tall, this monumental structure is sculpted to resemble an immense crouching jackal. A prevalent but unfounded rumor suggests that those who dare to sleep in the shadow of the crouching jackal risk undergoing a transformation into a werejackal, a dangerous lycanthropic creature common to this stretch of the desert. There's also a belief circulating that during ancient wars, the crouching jackal awakened, transforming into a colossal golem that prowled the desert, crushing Katapesh's adversaries beneath its stony paws. One renowned bard in Katapesh sings of how the blood of a martyred paladin dribbled on the paws of the crouching jackal can open a doorway into an ancient stronghold. Regardless of the veracity of these various claims, there are those willing to investigate and find out. Two grizzled old dwarves, Gravlet Truther and Kip Travis, operate an industrious mining and excavation enterprise in Katapesh and have started excavating the area around the crouching jackal and studying the statue itself. The two dwarves claim to have come into possession of an ancient scroll depicting other structures surrounding the statue and believe their efforts will uncover these lost structures buried beneath the sand. Perhaps they will provide answers to the questions surrounding the mysterious statue, or even find the secret entrance into a hollow interior which they firmly believe exists. Even if it weren't for their useful camp near the structure that travelers can use to resupply at, the Crouching Jackal's imposing figure would still hold importance for travelers, as it can be spotted from distances of up to four miles, making it a practical landmark for anyone seeking to navigate the expansive desert landscape. The Shrine of the Sleeping Dove Over a century ago, a devoted follower of Saren Ray embarked on a sacred pilgrimage to Solku. Unfortunately, their journey was marred by tragedy, when just days away from their destination, they fell victim to a merciless ambush by werejackals and were brutally slaughtered. The pilgrims' lifeless bodies lay exposed in the unforgiving desert for over a week, their white robes catching the winds and drawing the attention of passing travellers. The somber discovery prompted a group of Salku paladins to intervene, giving the fallen pilgrims the dignity they deserved. The paladins interred the deceased in the very spot they met their untimely end and in a gesture of piety they erected a shrine dedicated to Sarenray there. Since then, this hallowed ground has been held as a place of high reverence for the faithful of the Dawnflower. It has become a sanctuary where travellers can find respite and safety, shielded from the influence of malevolent entities that instinctively avoid the consecrated area. For those with the right disposition who spend a night at the shrine, the sacred site confers vivid and purposeful dream messages from an ethereal figure cloaked in radiant light. El Fatar 
Like Helmarain in the Uwaga Highlands, this once ancient city was abandoned and fell into ruin and disrepair during a decline period, but has much more recently been reclaimed and now has a new lease on life. These expansive city ruins were rediscovered by a daring pathfinder, who also stumbled upon a vast network of catacombs concealed beneath its dilapidated surface. Subsequent years brought an influx of adventurers down to the ruins, who were drawn by tales of unimaginable buried treasures protected by fearsome guardians. Some returned with spoils, while others vanished into the depths. As tales of the subterranean mystery spread, a burgeoning town emerged amidst the ruins. Initially centered around the catacombs, it expanded substantially when a resourceful rogue unveiled a second level beneath the catacombs, attracting a fresh wave of fortune seekers. The recent discovery of a third level solidified El Fatar's status as a permanent settlement. The plethora of captivating artifacts uncovered here have enticed scholars, researchers, and historians to the city. El Fatar's residents engage in a bustling trade, offering provisions, spelunking equipment, maps of varying accuracy detailing the catacombs, and an array of pottery, carvings, paintings, and other salvaged relics procured from the underground labyrinth. Several adventuring groups have chosen El Fatar as their base of operations, both driven by the shared goal of unraveling the mysteries underlying the catacombs and claiming the undoubtedly vast treasure trove still concealed within. Members of the Band of the Blazing Way proudly display glass amulets containing perpetual flames as symbols of their allegiance. Ruther Fanderan, the Unswervable, their chelish leader, is a skilled fighter, fixated on the potential riches buried beneath the sand. His rival is Aruna Riki, a Vudrani explorer who leads the Stars of the Earth adventuring party. She ostensibly professes a greater interest in uncovering knowledge than accumulating wealth, even though she eagerly secures her portion of the bounty recovered by her group. But it's not all fun and adventure in El Fatar. While treasure seekers happily sell the ancient finds they've been digging up here, they are disturbing legitimately dangerous ruins. One region yet to be disturbed are the deep catacombs of Itak Agduru, a long-dead cult of Assyriani serpent worshippers. These tunnels and chambers remain as yet untouched by mortal hands, their walls lined with intertwined serpent bodies made of inlaid precious metals with gems for eyes, but mindless undead wander their bedecked halls, former cultists who had been buried alive in the labyrinth when the cult was put down. El Hedek, a vile lich who displaced the high priest as the head of the cult in its waning days, sits perched on a great gold statue of a coiled serpent at the catacomb center, quietly biding his time until some foolhardy adventurer opens the door to his long-locked tomb. Vargas Swamp Spanning almost thirty miles, the Vargas Swamp stands as the largest swamp in Catapesh. Its diverse flora attracts various types of herbivores, which in turn have drawn predators such as alligators, vipers, eels, and chules. A small tribe of Iruxi has also made the swamp their home. As one of the oldest swamps in Catapesh, Vargas Swamp conceals numerous stone ruins as well as the remains of various ancient villages. The water level here has a tendency to fluctuate unpredictably, which some have attributed to a rumoured green dragon said to reside within the swamp. In the heart of the swamp is a towering stone monument, not unlike the crouching jackal of the desert. This 70-foot-tall stone statue of a reclining cat is called the Creeping Watcher. The creature depicted is no natural cat either. Its sinewy cat-like body appears to be adorned with carved stone scales, and its head has a distinctly reptilian look to it. Unlike the continuous structure of the crouching jackal, the Creeping Watcher features separate materials for its yellow eyes, which have defied all attempts to extract or even chip the unyielding stone. The origins of the Creeping Watcher, much like those of the Crouching Jackal, remain shrouded in mystery. Widely perceived as the more sinister of the two statues, some posit the Watcher serves as a site for dark rituals, sacrifice, and ancient pacts best left undiscovered. The Ruins of Slither Cove On the outskirts of the Vargas, marking the transition from wet swampland, are the channels of Sukith Ma, whose underground reservoirs transform the terrain into treacherous mud. In some stretches here, concealed beneath seemingly harmless sand, the area is riddled with quicksand pits, posing a constant threat to unsuspecting travelers and animals. Local residents are well aware of the dangers, but outsiders frequently fall prey to the sucking pits, vanishing without a trace. Where the Sukith Ma sands meet the jungle can be found the ruins of Slither Cove. This village derives its name from the abundant population of snakes, lizards, and various reptiles that once thrived within its confines. Twenty years ago, an unforeseen flood permanently elevated the waters of the Vargas Swamp to a new level, resulting in the destruction of most structures in Slither Cove. Disheartened by their misfortune, the survivors chose to abandon the ruined settlement. 
Eight years later, rumors circulate that the flood was no natural calamity, but an orchestrated event, a result of dark sacrifices and entreaties to evil deities, possibly linked to the enigmatic creeping watcher of the swamp. Brave fortune seekers occasionally venture into the submerged ruins of Slither Cove in search of answers, but some never return, their disappearances attributed to the various vicious reptilian predators that lurk therein. The Sabka Salt Flats and Floaters Pond Forty miles south of Slither Cove lie the Sabka Salt Flats, characterized by a superficial basin covered in gritty salt-laden sands. Sabka stands as the primary reservoir for Nagri Salt, a crucial component in the production of pesh. While other salt flats dot the Katapeshi Desert, Sabka distinguishes itself as the largest and most sought after. Seasonally, farmers make pilgrimages to Sabka, engaging in the process of sifting salt from the soil and transporting sacks of this precious commodity back to their homes. Merchants also frequent Sabka, gathering Nagri salt for subsequent sale in the bustling markets of Katapesh. Just west of the flats lies an oasis called Floater's Pond. It is nourished by subterranean streams and emerges as a beautiful blue basin amidst the deeply salinated sands. Here, saline infusion from the flats renders the waters of Floater's Pond exceptionally buoyant. This unique quality makes drowning nearly impossible within its confines and offers an extraordinary experience to those who venture into its embrace. A resourceful community of Shemtej catfolk, who have abandoned their nomadic ways, have settled here, where they engage in a patient and meticulous process to extract the special Nagri salt from Floater's Pond. This method involves immersing linen sheets in the buoyant waters and subsequently laying them out to dry under the scorching sun. While the extraction process may be laborious, it has brought a measure of wealth and prosperity here, allowing the community to acquire various foreign luxuries as they have grown their settlement. The Sparadin Jungle, about 20 miles southeast of the Salt Flats and 20 miles south of the southern bend of the River Scorpius, lies an expanse of tall tropical trees called the Sparadin Jungle. Here, tribes of Iruxi make their homes, sister tribes to the swamp dwellers in Vargas to the north. On the southern edge of the jungles, a stepped pyramid called the Pyramid of the Agate King leans westwards against the desert, partially engulfed by the soft ground of the forest. Crafted from weathered granite, the pyramid's blocks bear slender veins of vibrant red and gold marble, with iridescent pearl-colored agate forming mesmerizing ripples along the steps, ascending the structure's center. Believed to house the eternal repose of a long-forgotten legend known as the Agate King, the tomb cradles not only the remains of this mythical figure, but also the opulent treasures he sought to carry with him into the afterlife. Since these levels have been looted, over time the pyramid has drawn a motley array of occupants, ranging from bandits and cultists to savage humanoids. Gennett Manor Gennett Manor is a large Katapeshi villa overlooking a particularly majestic portion of the River Scorpius. It was commissioned by the wealthy Druman calistocrat Tamil Passad, also referenced in my Druma Region Deep Dive video. All told, Gennett Manor is a modest affair, at least insofar as the standards for Druman holdings go. It is a two-story building of ornate stone built around a central atrium, in the Kadiran style, and surrounded by a protective wall. When the Kalistocrat or his servants are not present, care of the manor falls to a retired Katapeshi Zephyr guard named Gamaradim Po and his wife Domitilla. Significantly, Gennett Manor served as the site of a confrontation between the members of the Pathfinder Society and members of the Aspis Consortium, led by the notorious sorceress Levilla Cosmopoli, in the course of a hunt for a rare Tian manuscript called the Mutani Manual of Martial Mastery. The details of this encounter are played out in the first edition Pathfinder Society adventure, The Gennett Manor Gauntlet. The City of Katapesh the final major point of interest in the River Valley's territory is, of course, Katapesh City itself. However, because that is such a detailed location in its own right, I will hold coverage of the capital and save it for the end of the video, findable via the chapter markings below. Stonespine and the North Coast Stonespine Island is a very large island off the northwestern coast of Katapesh, surrounded by a string of smaller isles that range so close to Kadira that they ultimately actually make for a narrower sea crossing here than exists between Osirian and Kadira at the Strait of Mereb in the north. Beyond the pirates, the only native peoples of these islands are a hardy breed of seafaring gnolls, as well as their cousins, the Redridge Knoll tribe, a more rugged breed of mountain gnolls who can be found in the steep reaches of the Stonespine Mountains. The breathtaking waterfalls that tumble from the Stonespine Mountains were the reason pirates first began to use the area just west of the Yellow Harbour as anchorage. The many coves and natural harbours across the island also served as excellent cover for the visitors' activities. 
For over a thousand years, the islands were used as a sheltered place for pirates to rest, get provisions, and hide from retribution from hostile nations. Before that, the island saw only brief action, when Kadira used the island as a staging ground from which to invade Katapesh in the 16th century. Captain Ilmatis Okeno proclaimed herself ruler of the cove in 3496, giving the port the name it still carries today, and she ruled it for many years before her attempt to unite the pirates ultimately led to her demise. Despite the lack of centralized leadership, the port thrived for centuries. The Pact Masters, arriving two centuries later, annexed Stenspine Island into Katapesh, but allowed slaving to continue under a Katapeshi governor or Muhafiz. Since then, the territory has maintained unity, with carefully targeted raids and strategically held alliances. Muhafiz Morio Midasi, pragmatic and unscrupulous, enforces minimal laws here, leading through intellect rather than brute force. His network of allies and informants spans the region, and it is said he employs a charmed Gug as a personal bodyguard, which he reportedly purchased for 23,000 gold pieces in Okeno's flesh fairs. Important locations in this region include the city of Okeno. Located beneath the imposing peaks of Stone Spines Mountains, Okeno is devoid of traditional walls or fortifications. Instead, its defenses lie in the fearsome reputation of the pirates that moor here. The natural harbour at the mountain's foothills provides serene anchorage, resilient even in the face of the fiercest monsoons. Stretching about 700 yards across, the bay accommodates even the mightiest warships. Rising from the waters like a monolith carved from a single bedrock, Stonetown flourishes as the city's vibrant heart. Crafted from this ashen stone, it hosts bustling mundane markets and serves as the dwelling place for common folk, including artisans and merchants. Following the unloading of cargo, ships find anchor at the aged New Dock. This tiered marina, constructed from ancient ship timbers, rises above the sea, presenting a bewildering maze of piers, walkways, and cranes. Constantly battered by storms and mists from the Stonespine Mountains, New Dock has become a patchwork result of centuries of makeshift repairs. Governed by Captain Permelia Pegleg Cockle and her were-rat helpers, this area serves as a taxing point for visiting ships, and its stability is as precarious as the ships it hosts. At the north end of Stonetown, the Black Circus hosts weekly entertainment spectacles, infamous across Okeno and beyond for its bloody performances. Master of Ceremonies Ictarius, a tiefling necromancer, oversees the elaborate production. Above Stonetown, the elite reside in lofty bowsprit. With broader streets and better maintenance, bowsprit contrasts with the rest of Okeno. While the lower streets and attractions like the Black Circus welcome visitors, those venturing higher undergo close scrutiny. Along the bowsprit rise, the notorious high road, safeguarded by vigilant guards, leads towards the upper mountains, ensuring the security of the nearby pesh fields and mountain tracks, leading to concealed slaver strongholds. At the northeast end of the high road lies the palace of a member of Stonespine Island's Knoll's Lines of Chieftains, a most famous slaver known as the Hyena Princess Niano. This palace is graced by spring water falling from high in the stone spines. The water is used to great effect here, with a whole wing built above a lake. The paranoid Princess Niano cannot always be found here, however, as she has many enemies and she changes her home from time to time, even taking quite humble lodgings on occasion, provided each can offer her daily baths in milk, as is her royal preference. In stark contrast with the rest of Bowsprit, at the end of Bowsprit Pier, a flotilla of old strung-together vessels forms the fleet. This repugnant haven for sailors seeking rest is a vast maze-like structure of old ships floating in the harbour. While its general condition is deplorable, the stern, a more refined section, caters to those who can afford its higher prices. Admiral Ziban Menkent oversees the fleet, wielding authority with a quick temper and a menacing whip. South of Stone Town and Bowsprit, Okeno sprawls into a labyrinth of sunless alleys and streets, a maze of treacherous dead ends and corners where cutthroats lurk, eagerly targeting those with bulging pockets. Regardless of the path taken, all roads here eventually lead to the notorious flesh fairs, for which this sprawling neighborhood is named, sprawling auctions where lives are commodified. The old flesh fair, the grandest of them all, resides deep in this district, witnessing the passage of hundreds and thousands of lives. The Okeno tanning pits can also be found here, overseen by local traders. This is an open courtyard where tanners work amid the stench of animal cadavers piled up high against the nearby buildings. The harbour district comprises the oldest part of the city, and includes the Yellow Harbour, the original and oldest dock, as well as Harbour Island, a secure island in the centre of the bay, with a large lighthouse built precariously over a stone fort. Along the Yellow Harbour, clinging to the rocky shoreline, various bars, taverns, and other establishments offer entertainment for pirates on shore leave. 
Here, Knowles employed to serve in the local watch keep a sharp eye out for trouble. Other points of interest in the Harbour District include The Rat's Tail, an opulent gambling house owned by Rathiri Halmus, a halfling were-rat alchemist, which offers a unique blend of charm and danger. Halmus is reputedly the wealthiest person in Okeno and harbors aspirations of becoming the city's governor. Known for his uncanny memory and dangerous charm, Halmus happily admits that his personal motto is The House Always Wins. Two major temples can also be found here, the Shrine of Thafar, dedicated to Gosre, a bustling temple in Stonetown, presided over by Tian priests Niharo and Owayu. Despite their feisty nature, the siblings are highly valued for their effective blessings placed on departing ships. Also, the Chained Vault, a notable bank of Abadar, boasting a towering structure housing an intricately decorated interior with a large golden candelabrum. The present priest and judge, Justice Henball, maintains a stern and humorless demeanor, offering a rare example of incorruptibility in Okeno. The shipyard houses skilled shipbuilders and artisans, with Falak Tuba as the most prominent shipbuilder, while Shipwreck Plaza, a market square formed from lashed ship timbers, offers somewhat luxurious residences that have attracted wealthier patrons from among the city's criminal elements. Finally, there is the Palace of Honeyed Stone, the residence of Muhafiz Morio Medasi himself. A golden structure surrounded by beautifully maintained gardens, rumored to house exotic slaves and monstrous creatures, the palace is heavily fortified. Recent rumors surrounding Muhafiz Morio Medasi suggest the governor is increasingly at odds with the secretive pact masters, which might explain why increasingly he is rarely seen outside the manor. Fort Stonejaws Located high up on the Red Ridge Hills, Stonespine Island's knoll country, is a large Kadiran fort. It's believed that its original function was to serve as a military camp when Stonespine Island was being used as a staging ground for the Kadiran army at the turn of the 16th century. After the island was abandoned, it came to be occupied by Knowles, who gave it its current name, but it was later repurchased and cleaned up by the scion of a major Kadiran merchant family. Pasha Mulia al-Jakri had become a prominent representative of Kadiran interests in Absalom, and thought acquiring a fort and building a relationship with the pirates of Okeno would allow her to more safely transition cargo from southern Kadira to Absalom without having her goods seized on the way. Mulia al-Jakri even served as a Pathfinder Society representative for the Kadiran faction, before she vanished abruptly from Absalom affairs after a scandal revealed she had been responsible for the murder of Talden Baron Giacomo del Sino in 4711. After this, she retreated to Fort Stonejaws, got heavily involved in the slave trade, and became a major underground information broker. Mulia al-Jakri is a character featured heavily in a number of Pathfinder Society adventures, and this particular property of hers, Fort Stonejaws, is featured in the adventure The Slave Master's Mirror. The Stonespine Archipelago In addition to Stonespine Island, various other islands comprise the Greater Stonespine Archipelago. Off the eastern coast of the Stone Spine is Black Sands Island, noteworthy for its beaches of black sand and the dormant volcano that lies at its heart. The large island off the western coast is called Six Shells Island, and a little further west from this island lies another major island in the chain before the mainland, Sandhaven Island. Of particular note is that a small Katapeshi port town can be found off the coast of Sandhaven called Chiron. With a population of just over a thousand permanent residents, the town of Chiron functions as a legitimate stopover and resupply point in the archipelago, and therefore sees a good deal of ship traffic making its way from the Obari to the Inner Sea. The Pact Masters have invested to make sure Chiron remains relatively secure from all the pirates in the region, but beyond its immediate waters all bets are off, and very many pirates, mostly headquartered in Okeno, make these waters among the most treacherous outside of the shackles. Some pirates of renown operating in the Stonespine archipelago include Ziren Bey. This Keleshi pirate commands the galley Undertow and has been a prominent figure in Okeno for over a decade. Captain Bey displays a dual nature, exuding diplomacy and grace on land while embracing a cutthroat demeanor at sea. Captain Kitha Saltspray, the half-elf captain of the galley Branded Chain, maintains a reserved and distant manner, even refraining from socializing with her officers in port. Persistent rumors suggest she has a past as a slave herself, yet Captain Saltspray exhibits no sympathy for the captives she sells. Captain Brellet Vineau, the Chellish captain of the galleon Sea Gargoyle, remains tight-lipped about his departure from Cheliax. He does, however, happily share tales of confrontations with Shackles pirates and rival slavers in Cheliax, making him a lively presence in Okeno's taverns when in port. The Smuggler Port of Driftwood when viewed from the water, the driftwood inlet appears to be surrounded by forbidding sheer-walled cliffs, giving it an unwelcome and treacherous appearance. 
However, those acquainted with the region understand the navigational tricks required to maneuver around the rocks and access the inlet. Here, the initially imposing cliffs give way to unveil a shallow, sheltered cove. Despite the thriving hidden port here, driftwood remains relatively obscure among legitimate trade ships, but smugglers and pirates, on the other hand, have disseminated knowledge of driftwood within their clandestine networks. The cove now serves as a small harbor for those seeking a discreet port from which to launch assaults against affluent yet underprotected vessels. Occasionally, bandits and smugglers choose to conceal their ships in driftwood while conducting onshore activities, but they typically deploy a substantial contingent of guards. This precaution is necessary, as leaving ships undefended in driftwood has proven to result in their mysterious disappearance. The Southern Barrier Wall Katapesh's southwestern territory is centered around the city of Solku. It is dry, barren mountain country, an impractical site to construct a major city, and yet Solku, the second largest city in Katapesh, can be found here. The devout cult of Sarenre that founded the city, initially called the Bastion of Sarenre, expressly chose this site for its remote location, because at the time they had been exiled for their extremist ideals by the Sultanate of Osirian. Despite its remote location, Solku has continued to grow and prosper, thanks in part to the construction of the famous Nexian road called the Barapara Uchafru, or the Road of Dirt, which has served to connect it with the Nexian city of Anopian to the south. The road is the safest way in and out of Solku, safer than braving the deserts of Katapesh, certainly, as Nexian magic protects it and it is patrolled by wandering Nexian war golems. Important locations in this region include Solku, the walled city of Solku is an island of civilization in a perilous and unforgiving land, where both Knoll and human raiders have broken their claws and blades against the town's formidable defenses. Even in relatively calm periods, bandits and slavers lurk outside the protective walls, preying on vulnerable targets. Despite these constant threats, Solku's gates have traditionally remained open, housing a healthy population of over 5,000 residents and welcoming traders from all across Garand and beyond. Indeed, in the busier trade seasons, the city's population can swell to accommodate over 7,000 people, making rooms at taverns and inns quite costly. In the early period of the Age of Lost Omens, Saranite paladins used Solku as a strategic base from which to combat slavery in the surrounding region. They launched raids on slave pens, reaching as far as the nation's capital in their fervent efforts. However, the noble cause faced a setback when the majority of these abolitionists were captured, instilling fear of brutal reprisals and ultimately leading to the cessation of their endeavors. Thankfully, the firebrands in the Badawi Pesh Growers Guild were able to succeed where the Saranite paladins could not, and since the repeal of the flesh fairs in recent years, these paladins have focused their attention instead on matters of local security. Their presence in the city, however, didn't prevent Knoll forces under the leadership of Warchief Rath Sandstalker from besieging Salku with overwhelming numbers in recent years. Recognizing the imminent danger, Lady Sinor sought assistance from her allies in the Church of Ayamade. In a climactic and decisive clash known as the Battle of Red Hail, Salku's defenders successfully repelled the siege, but at a considerable cost, including the death of Lord Hanif Osahar and most of the Ayamadean paladins who had come with him. Civilian casualties were high as well, and although the Knolls were forced to retreat, they were not conclusively defeated. Presently, murmurs circulate that the Knoll forces are regrouping in the mountains, sparking fears among Solku's leaders that the hard-won peace may prove to be short-lived. Within the safety of the city walls, Solku today looks much as it did before the Siege of Red Hail, a settlement of multi-story stone buildings, most of them walled and subdivided into compounds with several owners in a central courtyard. Such compounds may house the headquarters of trading houses, extended families, perhaps even along with a family business, or groups of artisans sharing living and working spaces together. Larger buildings feature wind catchers to fight the burning heat, or magical means of climate control if the inhabitants can afford it. Most buildings feature brightly colored doors, and those belonging to Saren Ray's faithful are often painted red in her honor. Poorer citizens, however, live in crammed tenements or shacks built from whatever materials they can scavenge. The city of Solku is divided into six districts. Temple Hill. The town's central district is dominated by the majestic Lambent Citadel, which was constructed at the point of the highest natural rise, towering over almost everything else in the walled city. Constructed in 3722 following the successful defense of Solku against various slaver raids, the Lambent Citadel of Sarenray stands as a testament to the town's renewed favor from the goddess. The cathedral, with its famed stained-glass dome, is a grand structure, providing shelter, prayer chapels, housing for clergy and pilgrims, a hospital, and a well-guarded treasury. Lady Shinar Sinor, a hero of the Siege of Solku, leads the temple, actively participating in its management and charitable works. Across the road from the Lambent Citadel is the town hall. 
This central building houses the town's council chamber, the offices of Lord Muhafiz Kel Kalar, and the courtroom. Adjoining structures accommodate the main guard barracks, armory, and Solku's prison. Marjan Hedea, the guard commander, collaborates with the head of training at the Citadel, Adar Bilyadin, ensuring they remain ready for anything. The complex serves as a hub for civic affairs, with Lord Kel Kalar remaining approachable despite the town's many demands. At the north end of Temple Hill, the Church of Iomade is the second largest temple in town. A much more modest and more recent construction than the Lambin Citadel, it serves a congregation of Iomadean worshippers. High Priestess Samira Brahan, disillusioned by the loss of Iomadean paladins during the recent siege, is growing sceptical of the ruling Saronites. Finally, on the eastern rise of Temple Hill, just across the way from the town hall, is the New Market. Larger by half than First Market, located on Riverside, New Market is the largest open-air market in Solku. Vendors hawk their wares to visitors here, with the goods being sold having come from across Garand and Avistan. The market also serves as a hub for trade houses, and has attracted mercenaries and specialists seeking caravan work. East Wall. The southeastern and southwestern districts, East Wall and West Wall respectively, were most heavily hit during the various sieges in Solku's history. They are therefore today the most heavily reinforced and monitored, with lookouts constantly scanning the southern desert for any signs of raiding parties. East Wall offers a number of valuable services and entertainments to visiting traders and merchants. A famous casino and gambling hall owned by Hamarad Karyadros can be found here. Those in the know are aware that Hamarad has a special relation with a nearby Condor company, and he targets skilled inebriates, offering debt relief in exchange for a written service agreement. Led by Rostam Kwasi, the Condor company offers bodyguards and caravan guards at what sound like reasonable rates. However, this is because the pay and benefits for the guards themselves are quite poor, and many have been lured into joining by promises of paying off their gambling debts. So many of these warriors are sullen and lax, and as often as not, abandon their charges if faced with any real danger. Another point of interest in the East Wall district is the Illumium Observatory. The home and workshop of noted celestial scholar Gamar Deshta, the observatory is the premier place of study on the hallucinatory effects of prolonged sun exposure. Gamar is also well versed in a range of scientific topics and is often sought out by visiting academics. West Wall. Like East Wall, West Wall has been reinforced and refortified in recent years, with exceptionally thick walls and a great many guard towers. Several soldiers patrol the city's high walls along the southern stretch at all hours of the day and night. West Wall's thick fortifications also serve to protect numerous establishments that cater to visiting merchants and pilgrims. Located in the shadows of the high western wall, Breakstride Inn is a renowned inn and tavern managed by retired adventurer Eraline Finch. Eraline's staff is always comprised of numerous liberated halfling slaves. Another well-known lodging in West Wall District caters specifically to Saronite pilgrims. The Dawnflower's Pure Rest, it is called, and it is known for its ascetic atmosphere. Innkeeper Atash Ramin, a devout member of the Cult of the Dawnflower, directs much of her profits to the Lamban Citadel. Riverside. A small tributary of the Alemian runs along the west side of the city, though the size of the tributary varies considerably depending on the season. Riverside District is the central district facing the river, and like Westwall, it caters predominantly to the city's seasonal visitors. Local points of interest include the First Market, Smaller than New Market, First Market caters mostly to locals, offering everyday goods and hearty meals. The Song Emporium within the market, run by Oluheye Wakei, sells not only common birds, but also unique and intelligent avian companions for those well-versed in the art of falconry. The Demerkez Armory. Run by dwarf smith Rikab Demerkez, the bustling armory is not only a popular spot to pick up armor and weapons by citizens, visitors, and mercenaries, but also does a steady business supplying weapons and armor to the town guard as well. The Gilded Dreams Pesh Parlor. Owned by Dabir Ghazalim, Gilded Dreams specializes in unique Pesh variants. The upper floors exude luxury, while the cellars cater to a poorer and more desperate crowd. Dabir also functions as an effective information broker in town, and is rumored to have connections with various bandit groups. Keb's Atars and Tonics Run by Goli Keb, this shop specializes in refined pesh concoctions and alchemical products. Goli Keb is a prominent supplier of pesh to Dabir Gazalim's pesh parlor, and the shop is also known for its other experimental and exotic offerings. The North End The northernmost district in Solku is also the artistic heart of the city. Local artisans and performers can be found here. Sections of the North End are quite poor, however, and the North End is also the location of the Dustyfoot slum. Dustyfoot houses refugees, pesh addicts, and other unhoused. 
Patriarch Idris Kebede, a philanthropist of the Saranite faith, has long advocated for better conditions and improved services for the city's poorer residents. Beyond this, the dominant feature of the North End is the Rising Dove Amphitheatre. Salku's main public performance space hosts various events, especially Sarenray-themed plays. Amphitheatre director Cameron Jalal always keeps an eye out for potential performers. Another, less well-known locale in the district is the House of Soaring Illusions, a known performance art group's compound, serving as living and working space. The troupe's leaders offer their home to paying guests to fund their ambitious shadow theatre pieces. Hillside Salku's eastern side is built into the jagged cliffs of the Southern Barrier Range, so its central eastern district is called Hillside. The city's wealthiest residents live here, and it includes the headquarters of some of the city's prominent merchant houses. Prominent such trade houses include the Medanit House and the Three Lions Consortium, and their buildings here serve as offices, residences, and storage for valuable goods. They are heavily guarded, and theft from them can lead to pursuit by deadly recovery agents. The Aspis Consortium also owns a large and impressive building in Hillside. Other points of interest in Hillside include Zaytun Supplies, a general supply store owned by husband and wife Ambal and Meseret Zaytun, the thrice-blessed coffee house run by Faiz Kendi, a popular spot for finalizing business deals, and the Serpentine Blades headquarters. Led by Aswaya Steo, this mercenary company is known for its bravery and honesty. Aswaya actively seeks new members, but imposes challenging tasks on them before they are allowed to join so that they may prove their merit. Fort Longjaw Situated northeast of Salku, close to the border with the northern highlands, proudly stands a fortress bulwark against the constant threat of null aggression. A vivid red flag, adorned with a stark white jawbone cleaved by a gleaming silver sword, billows above the wooden stockade. Under the leadership of Jana Secondstride, a skilled Katapeshi captain, the Longjaw Rangers hone their knoll fighting prowess through daily activities, such as extensive scouting, hunting for slaver tracks, setting up deceptive lost caravans as decoys, and questioning travelers for any indications of knoll presence. Visitors seeking to camp at Fort Longjaw experience cautious hospitality. Jana permits travelers to stay a night within the fort, but requests donations to support the stockade's maintenance a fee which she waives in the case of those in evident distress, especially those who have faced null ambushes. Travelers reporting such attacks undergo thorough interrogations, with Jana seeking specific details to aid in pursuing and confronting the assailants. Suspected dishonest visitors face Jana's wrath, being stripped of weapons and provisions before being sent out into the desert alone. Jana's reputed short temper, penchant for bloodshed, and intense hatred for Knolls creates an aura of fear among outsiders. Tales of her fiery outbursts discourage casual visitors from approaching the fort. Unfazed by the lack of company, Jana relishes the solitude, while the well-provisioned fort, stocked with dried rations, water, ale, arrows, and salvaged weapons and armor from defeated gnolls, manages to remain largely self-sufficient. The Beehive Deep in the Barrier Wall Mountains, the Beehive boasts a labyrinthine network of chambers interconnected by winding tunnels, rendering it a secure and easily defensible complex. Possibly built originally by dwarves, the beehive now plays host to a hive of formians, ant-like humanoids, who originally hail from the same world the elves first came from. Industriously engaged in the excavation of new tunnels and chambers, they have so far displayed minimal interest in the rest of Katapesh, or the external world in general. The strategic position of the beehive along the southern road to Nex, coupled with its well-known entrances, have contributed to its historically consistent turnover in population, but the Formians have endured here, in part due to their lack of possessions and non-threatening nature towards other groups. Despite this, persistent rumors circulate about hidden treasures left by previous smugglers or valuable ore nodes concealed in the deepest corners of the caverns that eluded the dwarves' previous explorations. The Zollerket Mines Formerly known as the Mines of Tar Urkotka, the now depleted platinum mines have been renamed Zolurket, meaning the Dark Death in Kaleshi. This is because in the late years of the mines' operations, they became overrun by undead predators. Drawn by the allure of potential riches, treasure hunters who have ventured into Zolurket share fragmented and frequently conflicting stories, leaving the exact nature of the undead inhabitants unknown. Surviving explorers have, however, reported the presence of a dwarven ghost named Tib, who materialized before them, relaying the story of how he met his demise engulfed in poison gas upon breaching a subterranean chamber. The tales surrounding Tib's purpose, however, are conflicting, 
with some asserting that he seeks a lost possession like a pickaxe, while others claiming he searches for a worthy recipient to impart some secret knowledge about a lucrative platinum vein. A further rumor suggests Tib was a former partner to the dwarven excavators of the Crouching Jackal I referenced earlier, Gravelet Truther and Kip Travis. Regardless, a recent development regarding the mines is the appearance of a group of dwarves at the Sueda Lodge in the Catapash Desert, with the intent of reclaiming the Zolderket mines. Rejecting the notion that the mine was depleted, these dwarves have insisted the miners abandoned it after accidentally uncovering a cursed shrine to Norgorber, leading to the release of the shadowy entities that now occupy it. Armed with holy relics and accompanied by a cleric of Torag, the dwarves seek to purify and reclaim the mines. Commonfield More a cluster of homesteads than a formal town, Commonfield stands out in Catapesh for its high concentration of pesh crops. While some fields are modest, measuring only 30 feet on each side, others sprawl across almost an acre. The community comprises 22 farmers, their families and hired hands, amounting to a population of over 100. The farmers of Commonfield, generally characterized by their honesty and diligence, approach strangers with caution due to the value of their precious crop. Having been targeted by thieves and raiders in the past, each farmer must post guards around their crops day and night. Occasionally travelers passing through Commonfield propose trading a day's labor in the fields for a night's accommodation and a home-cooked meal. The farmers usually accept such offers, providing the traveler contributes earnestly to the fields and agrees to leave their weapons in the kitchen during the night. Since the emergence of the Badawi Pesh Growers Guild in the Katapesh Desert to the southeast, the farmers of Commonfield have considered joining the guild and abandoning their agreements with the Pesh Trade Guildmasters of Katapesh City. Despite their favorable opinion of the Badawi growers, fearing potential reprisal, they have yet to finalize on this decision. Commonfield lacks a single ruler. Instead, tradition dictates that the five wealthiest farmers convene weekly to discuss matters such as coordinating guard patrols, assessing the season's progress, addressing issues like insect or rodent pests affecting the crops, forecasting weather for the next month, or other relevant topics. Among the current council members, two individuals stand out. Richelle Gerst, a sullen and socially awkward half-elf with a business-minded attitude, and Carrick Colstone, a lively patriarch of a large halfling farmstead. The Evergrowth Swamp Evergrowth presents a stark contrast to the stereotypical image of the dark and foreboding swamp. Here, golden sunlight filters through a lattice of vibrant green vines and furled leaves. The swamp features clear, shallow ponds, teeming with multicolored fish, surrounded by thick fronds, musical frogs, and humming insects. Sunflowers and tropical blossoms adorn the edges of the ponds, while thriving bushes laden with heavy seed pods trail their branches in the water. This lush and vibrant environment makes Evergrowth a haven for herbalists, as nearly any plant sought can be found within its borders. In addition to the natural inhabitants, unsavory characters such as gnolls, smugglers, and bandits venture into Evergrowth in search of rare plants and herbs. One unique feature of Evergrowth is that it is the only place in Catapesh where kobolds reside. This community of giant lizard herders, whom they conspicuously resemble, are a remarkably pacifistic and pleasant lot, atypical of most kobold communities. Situated at the edge of Evergrowth, and consisting of a collection of huts perched on stilts, lies the town of Bug Harbor. The town earns its name from the multitude of insects that populate the swamp, including dragonflies, water striders, mosquitoes, and black flies. While Bug Harbor has only a few hundred permanent residents, it sees a steady flow of visitors due to its thriving trade in herbs and plants. Alchemists, herbalists, wizards, and druids frequently journey to Bug Harbor in search of rare components, or seeds of plants on the verge of extinction. The town's economic success is also tied to a clandestine field of false pesh concealed within the Evergrowth. These slimy bulbous plants release a milky sap that mimics the appearance of pesh. However, instead of providing a pleasant euphoria, the false pesh induces vomiting and fever, and sometimes even death. Naturally, those in Bug Harbor who are involved in the trade of false pesh work diligently to conceal their activities, recognizing that interference in the pesh trade could attract the attention of the Pact Masters. The Catapesh Desert. From the Alemian River to the Sparadin Jungle and the Sabka Salt Flats, Catapesh is almost entirely sand-blown desert. The southern half of the desert, leading to the Nexian border, is the most dangerous part. Dubbed the Trackless Storm, its defining characteristics are windstorms and the ever-shifting sands that bury and uncover landmarks overnight. These constant sandstorms vary in intensity, ranging from mild, dusty clouds to wild tempests that can strip skin from bone. The inhospitable nature of the desert here deters all but the most desperate travelers. 
The rest of the desert, while sparsely populated, is home to a number of specialized communities, particularly nomadic groups like the Varanoi Desert Elves and the Shemtej Catfolk. The indigenous Badawi tribe of humans was also mostly nomadic, but they have begun to settle into large camps in recent years and have been a politically influential force in the country as a whole. The Badawi Pesh Grower Camps Highly concentrated in the western reaches of the desert, not far from the cluster of farms known as the Common Fields, the Badawi nomads began harboring escaped slaves in large numbers around a decade ago, as the Saranite paladins of Solku were having increased success in liberating slaves across the country. In the remote recesses of the desert, these slaves learned to grow and harvest pesh, having moderate success in selling their pesh paste through various back channels. Only a couple of years ago, the popularity of their pesh aroused the attention of the Pact Masters, who raised an army of Zephyr Guard and their powerful Alum enforcers to raid the Badawi pesh farms. Despite the odds, the Badawi nomads and the emancipated slaves that formed the majority of that community, supported by paladins from Solku, held the line against the Pact Masters' forces. After Zephyr Guard armies were forced to retreat at the end of the initial Badawi siege, the Badawi pesh grower camps declared themselves a member cell of the Firebrands, an anti-slavery faction that had been growing in prominence across the Inner Sea. Firebrand cells across the Inner Sea declared their support for the Badawi camps, and seeing the international community galvanize against them, forced the Pact Masters to rethink their strategy. In 4722, caving to international pressure from the firebrands, the Pact Masters outlawed slavery in Katapesh and recognized the Badawi camps as a new Katapeshi trading guild, allowing them to continue their pesh trade, but now through legal taxable channels. This has been a mixed blessing for the Badawi, as since that time the Pact Masters have enforced greater control over the camps, using the various legal means at their disposal. The Observatory, some 20 miles east of the Badawi camps and 50 miles south of Floater's Pond, is a mysterious stone structure. It measures 20 feet on each side and is situated on a flat plain in the north end of the desert. Four crumbling pillars mark the corners of the platform, and at its center lies an ornate carving of a butterfly. The origin of the observatory is shrouded in mystery and no one knows who built it. The stonework, however, appears dwarven, which is unusual for Katapesh, especially in a shrine dedicated to Desna, some speculate that the platform is the only remaining part of an older dwarven ruin. The purpose of this mystical observatory becomes apparent to those who lie face up on the platform. Within the square of sky framed by the pillars, the heavens appear enormously magnified. Stars pulse like heartbeats, comets streak across the sky like flaming arrows, and the celestial panorama unfolds in a captivating display of cosmic wonder. While the observatory itself possesses no known mystic powers beyond its ability to amplify the sky, it remains a popular attraction for astronomers, prophets, and followers of Desna who seek divine inspiration amidst the celestial spectacle. Finder Plain With a population of over 2,000 gnomes, Finder Plain is the largest of Katapesh's predominantly gnome-inhabited settlements. The city is led by Wexless Bean, a charismatic bard who has held power unexpectedly long given the traditionally transient nature of leadership in Finder Plain. Indeed, the gnomes of Finder Plain are known for their transient lifestyle, with constant influxes and departures of citizens. Families rarely establish permanent homes here, drawn away by the lure of adventure and the surrounding desert. As a result, the citizenry undergoes almost a complete turnover every few years. It is often said a visitor to Finder Plain may return after only a year to find that they no longer recognize anyone. The city operates on a unique system where houses become free property if left unlived in for over a week. Any gnome visitors arriving in Finderplain can settle in any of the dozen unoccupied houses, and personal items left behind become the property of the new owner. Residents who leave in return cannot expect to find their old house available, and new owners have no obligation to return items or property to returning citizens. This constant cycle of turnover leads to newcomers bringing supplies and valuable items, which they trade with the current residents, and eventually leave behind for the next traveller. The Monument of Selkalas on the western edge of the Katapesh Desert, a cracked, headless stone torso lies half-buried in the sands. The torso, if fully intact, would have measured at least 20 feet in height. The statue exhibits slightly reptilian touches, leading some to theorize it may have originally been a serpent folk or naga. The only clue to its origin is the name Selkalas, engraved on the statue's back behind its shoulder blades. One of the torso's arms, still attached, protrudes from the sand, and its granite hands appear to have been hollowed around a missing weapon. The size of the empty grip suggests that the statue once held a weapon with a hilt, possibly a sword. Metallic scrapings around the hand indicate that the weapon was forcibly removed at some point. 
The ultimate fate of the weapon remains unknown, of course. However, this hasn't stopped enterprising vendors in Katapesh from capitalizing on this mystery, and each year several counterfeit Selkala swords get sold as priceless heirlooms to gullible buyers. Sanctum of Sand the Sanctum of Sand is a sprawling ruin, half buried by the desert, that once served as a religious site, although this specific deity worshipped remains unknown. The structure of the ruin suggests that the deity may have been of lawful or benevolent nature, while the presence of abandoned cell-like sleeping quarters hint at a convent or monastery, possibly for followers of Arori. However, other features, such as a large underground storehouse and broken spiraling tower, seem more in line with the worship of Abadar or Sarenre. Many priests and scholars have visited the sanctum over the years in an attempt to identify the deity associated with the ruins, but no definitive conclusions have been reached. While monsters occasionally inhabit the ruins, the frequent presence of armed explorers has deterred them from establishing a more permanent presence here. Miraza Miraza was once a typical oasis town, a waypoint for travelers braving the hard desert. However, a mysterious disaster befell the town, leaving nothing but desiccated and withered corpses in its wake, every drop of moisture seemingly drained from their bodies. For a period, Miraza remained abandoned, before the desert sands eventually covered the structures, the oasis dried up, and the town faded from memory altogether. Recently, however, some malevolent force has stirred the haunting memories of Miraza and its tragic residents. Travelers report sightings of disturbing mirages, or worse still, the sight of a welcoming town by a sparkling oasis, only to be replaced by claws of the desiccated dead bursting forth from shallow sands. The mystery of Miraza and the nature of the evil that plagues it has continued to elude investigators. Most today give it a wide berth. The Sueda Lodge Established by the Pathfinder Letvis Morgan 50 years ago, Sueda Lodge serves as a basis of operations for Pathfinders and other explorers seeking ancient Osiriani artifacts in the region of Katapesh. Letvis Morgan, the lodge's founder, passed away eight years after its establishment, and subsequent Pathfinders have taken on the responsibility of maintaining the lodge. The current caretaker is the dwarf ranger Var Pindervin, a knowledgeable and enthusiastic individual with a fascination for Katapesh's history. Pendervin focuses on cataloging and preserving artifacts brought to Sueda, providing shelter and supplies to fellow pathfinders, and engaging in knowledge exchange with adventurers in the region. Pendervin may enlist capable and trustworthy adventurers for small tasks, offering more information on promising excavation sites to those who prove themselves. The lodge itself is a low stone building with guest rooms, a kitchen, a pantry, a library, and a dining hall. Another building serves as the living quarters for Pindervin, and an underground chamber houses the archives accessible through a secret door in the main lodge. A well in the courtyard taps into an underground stream, and a protective wall of clay brick surrounds the enclosure, with Pindervin holding the key to the metal gate, providing access through the wall. The lodge acts as a hub for adventurers and scholars alike, fostering collaboration and discovery in the pursuit of Katapesh's rich historical secrets. The Palace Mortalis at some unknown point in Katapeshi history, a colossal beast died in the arid sands here, speculated to have been an ancient primordial dragon or some other titanic winged behemoth. Its true nature has been lost to time. Only the giant curving rib cages that rise from the desert like a cresting wave remain today. Over the years, resourceful travelers have repurposed the immense rib cage as a shelter. They use canvases, cloaks, and various materials stretched between the massive ribs to create makeshift lean-tos that offer protection against the relentless desert sun and blowing sands. As the popularity of this natural shelter grew, a mosaic of tarpaulins, blankets, shields, and sails now covers the bones and has turned it into a common stopping point for travelers. Caravans, adventurers, and experienced wanderers often speak of spending the night at Palace Mortalis as they traverse the vast and unforgiving Katapesh Desert. The Sable Sands Tar Pit Travelers occasionally mistake the dark blur on the horizon near Sable Sands for an oasis, only to discover it is a black, hundred-foot diameter tar pit that swallows up anything foolish enough to venture into its depths. Other curious phenomena are attributed to the Sable Sands as well. For instance, despite the rising temperature throughout the day, the locale here remains remarkably cool. Another clue that the pit might not be entirely natural is that along the southern stretch of the pit, the presence of a dozen weathered tombstones indicates that Sable Sands once served as a graveyard. Yet the identities of those interred and the origins of the site remain shrouded in mystery. It is possible the pit itself is the result of some curse or other that resides on the graveyard, and certainly the site sees no shortage of undead creatures emerging from the black morass to stalk the living. Tivens Reed Tivens Reed is another small town like Yavipo, Located along the long road that connected Osirian's main kingdom to its fertile southern reach, Tivens Reed was once a more significant settlement, a part of the old Osirian trade network. 
As the empire of Osirian fell into decline, Tivan's Reed came to be occupied by Katapesh's growing gnome population in the middle years of the Second Age. This moderately sized gnome settlement is slightly larger than Yavipo, but not quite as large or as eccentric as Finderplain. Kept vibrant and alive by the gnomes, Tivan's Reed continues to be a popular stop for merchants seeking markets for perishable goods that won't survive the journey up to Katapesh or down to Quantium. Tivan's Reed gnomes are also known to have a particular fondness for Pesh, which southbound merchants plying the Great Coastal Road are well aware of, and happy to bring with them. In exchange, the gnomes of Tivan's Reed, many of whom are of Keenspark kindred, offer intricate clockwork devices that find a ready market in the city of Quantium to the south. The Three Stars This mysterious trio of pyramids is located on the southeastern edge of the Katapeshi Desert. An ancient Osirian town once flourished here, not far from the coast, and along the road to the southern reach, but the town has since disappeared, and only the monuments remain. The pyramids are constructed from smooth blocks of yellow stone, and crowned with pointed blocks of transparent crystal that emits a radiant glow, especially pronounced under the light of the full moon. Though their enigmatic appearance have drawn countless scholars and explorers, there remain no known entrances leading to the interior of the pyramids. Most scholars suggest these pyramids likely contain the tombs of one of the many regional pharaohs that emerged in the tumultuous period between the First and Second Age of Osirian. However, one persistent legend suggests a different narrative. According to this tale, the three stars serve as the resting places for three benevolent and alien beings. Different versions of the legend propose that these sleepers will either awaken when Galarian becomes too chaotic for their liking, prompting them to either depart or restore peace, or that a chosen individual holds the key to awakening them. Some even speak of a fourth star, a secret hidden pyramid purportedly containing the means to unlock the other three. The city of Katapesh. Sprawling across a blistering hot sand valley lies one of the most astonishing and marvelous cities in all of Galarian the grand metropolis, the golden city of Katapesh. Enclosed by high walls, the city is well known as a marketplace where anything one desires can be acquired, exchanged, or sold for the right price. Katapesh epitomizes organized chaos, with gold reigning supreme and commerce taking precedence as the great deity. Fraught with setbacks, including a period in which the city suffered a 30-day onslaught of scorching sands during the year of scouring winds, the city has continued to reinvent itself. Perched above a series of black, glass-like cliffs known as the Obsidian Wall, Katapesh gazes upon the Obari Ocean from a sandy promontory. Below these cliffs, a level expanse extends to the sea, hosting some of Katapesh's bustling port areas. The city's perimeter is enclosed by a 40-foot high sandstone wall, adorned with ramparts and interspersed with crenellated towers. These are well patrolled by the Zephyr Guard, the standing army of the city's elusive and ruling alien oligarchs, the Pact Masters. The city is compartmentalized into five distinct districts, the Dawn Gate, the Docks, the Inner City, the Lower City, and the Twilight Gate. Alongside these major city sections, three smaller communities find refuge within the shade of Katapesh's towering walls. Dogtown clusters around the Dawn Gate. The Daystalls, a congregation of vendors and beggars, exists outside the Serpent Gate, and a community named the Sprawl, comprising craftsmen, vendors, farmers, and fishers, resides near the Twilight Gate. South and east of the Sprawl, Castle Clarion and its environs just barely qualify as a fourth community outside Katapesh's walls. Winding through parts of the city, the River Scorpius passes through the Serpent Gate, meanders into the Sprawl, and ultimately flows out into the Yobari Ocean. A network of bridges span its width, facilitating the passage of small watercraft and connecting the different areas of Katapesh, enabling swift transport of people and goods. The Dawn Gate District Similar to the lower city, this district of Katapesh evolved around the original city walls during the Oasis Age, a period marked by an influx of newcomers attracted by the city's allure. Dawn Gate hosts many of Katapesh's affluent business owners and numerous upper-middle-class residents. The Immaculate Repository Serving as a prominent temple of Abadar, master of the vault Jalal Abdul oversees the temple, providing services such as document notarization, business contract preparation, and scale certification. Abadar's clergy plays a crucial role in ensuring fair trade practices across the city. The Gilded Shell This turtle-shaped structure covered in gleaming metal plates belongs to the skilled armor Malthus Fehu. Malthus, along with his team, crafts masterwork-quality suits of armor, incorporating new and exotic materials provided by customers. Zulran's Ranch 
This horse ranch is run by Guildmaster Analdan Zulran and breeds exceptional horses and camels known for their extraordinary speed. Analdan is a legendary haggler and is also known to offer desert riding lessons, albeit at an exorbitant fee. The Golden Scarab, a renowned gambling hall owned by Krabby Jagel, a goblin rogue, the Golden Scarab features various games, from standard card games to exotic caged animal fights. The basement here is said to host the most intense and violent games in all of Galarian, constantly introducing new and bloodier challenges. The Smoking Ruin Once a residential and business area, the Smoking Ruin was devastated when a rift to the elemental plane of fire opened up, unleashing destructive elementals. The area remains unrepaired, haunted by the restless souls of the victims. Locals continue to seek adventurers willing to enter the ruins and put the souls to rest. The Docks Stretching out from Katapesh's eastern shore are over a dozen lengthy maze-like piers capable of accommodating numerous seagoing vessels. Warehouses, stores, and sizable inns line the docks, servicing the bustling sea trade. Facing the inner sea, a colossal copper statue of a horned giant, weathered and adorned with seagull droppings, stands sentinel-like, its original builders long since forgotten. Anexa Palanthia's Fish Menagerie Visitors paying a silver piece admission fee to this establishment are treated to a display of rare and exotic sea creatures. Anexa Palanthia, a collector with a penchant for the unusual, pays generously for rare finds to enhance her collection. Currently, she is interested in a sea monster rumored to have sunk the Star Runner, and she is discreetly recruiting adventurers to join her expedition ahead of her competitors. Jexler and Young Salvage Company Darg Jexler and Wilbur Young, seasoned sailors, operate this warehouse specializing in salvage operations and underwater expeditions. They sell both magical and mundane aquatic adventuring equipment and are preparing to investigate the recently attacked and sunk merchant vessel the Star Runner, seeking salvage rights for the wreck. Trillia's Bathhouse Trillia, a half-elf proprietor, offers weary travelers a haven for relaxation and private bathing chambers. For a modest fee, visitors can enjoy a hot-scented bath. Jerichal's Ales. Owned by Jerichal Ashworth, a retired adventurer turned brewmaster, this popular cantina serves a variety of ales, beers, and wines. Jerichal brews special concoctions named Priest in a Bottle, blending the pleasure of spirits with healing properties. Aside from the beverages, Jerichal provides useful information to adventurers and possesses a map to catacombs beneath the Pale Mountain, detailing various traps and guardians. The Inner City. Surrounded by ancient sandstone walls covered in faded, time-worn carvings and curious designs, the inner city is the oldest of Katapesh's districts. The inner city is also home to the walled palace of the Pact Masters, its soaring towers easily seen from anywhere in the city. Many ancient marvels dating back to the city's earliest existence 2,000 years ago rival each other in size, grandeur, and mystique. From the Grand Colosseum, the Marble Sphinx and the Golden Oasis, to the Glass Pyramids and the Screaming Obelisk, all of these and more can be found in the inner city. The College of Dimensional Studies A domed building serving as an institution for arcane studies, focusing on alternate dimensions and interdimensional travel. Students use a massive telescope here to study the stars, and the observatory is open to the public on certain nights for a fee. The college, lacking traditional doors, relies on teleportation magic for movement. Al Faran's Steel Restaurant. This unique establishment is part restaurant, part weapon shop. It is run by master weaponsmith Diab Al Faran, and he makes masterwork quality weapons made of fine Drumish steel. He also enchants weapons, and patrons can wait to get their weapon enchanted while they enjoy a nice plate of couscous made by Diab Al Faran's wife, who is also a master chef. Glass Pyramids. Two transparent metal plate pyramids house the remains of powerful dwarven wizards, Gesbria and Tralvar, who sought to harness magic located beneath the city. Rumors of entrances and disappearances surround these pyramids, attracting scholars and adventurers alike. The Golden Oasis, the last remaining oasis after the year of scouring winds, surrounding a large pond fed by the river Scorpius, it is a lush spot with date palms. Legends suggest patient and steadfast individuals may gain inspiration from the gods here. The pond also hosts various fish and aquatic plants. The Grand Colosseum, an enormous stone colosseum with tiered benches capable of seating 10,000 spectators. Various events, including both gladiator matches and the sport of rook, take place here. Rook is a violent sport in which two teams compete to get a ball through a hoop. Because the gameplay is quite rough, adventurers are often approached to join guilds and teams, with each year's season culminating in a grand tournament. The Marble Sphinx, a colossal statue, though not made of marble, depicts a sphinx and is believed to be harmless. 
only the most faithful of Lamashtu know it's truly a creation of the Mother of Monsters, a mighty sphinx of the ancient world turned to stone by her. The massive stone structure today continues to attract sightseers and scholars. The Nexian Embassy The Embassy of Nex maintains good relations with Katapesh, and is run by Ambassador Narlagut Haraxis. The Nexian Embassy also housed members of the Steel Falcons for a while, a group discussed in my Andoran deep dive video that was unwelcome in Katapesh for a long time due to their abolitionist stance. The Screaming Obelisk A massive spire made of smooth carnelian, functioning as a timekeeper similar to a sundial. Its enigmatic symbols and the harmonic whistling sounds it makes in high winds add to its mystery. Zandrex Pesh Palace a popular pesh parlor renowned for Master Zandrek's ability to satisfy all the desires of his guests. The palace is filled with private chambers, statuary, and well-trained servants catering to various needs and desires. The Lower City Lower City in Katapesh is the largest and most crowded area of the city. It has the city's big docks and probably the world's biggest bazaar. The Lower City Bazaar stretches the whole length of the city, and you can buy or sell almost anything there. Andrik the Chirurgeon a tent where skilled Dr. Andrik, also a gifted illusionist, offers services. He can enhance beauty or provide disguises using both magical and mundane techniques. Ahmed's Carpets Owned by Ahmed, a high-ranking member of the Weaver's Guild, this tent is a maze of rugs, tapestries, and sleeping pallets. Most notably, Ahmed is known to sell a small number of flying carpets here as well. Aromas and Aphrodisiacs a colorful tent run by Chang, a tiefling herbalist, offers relaxing herbs, aromatic teas, and other services. The Azure Star. A popular cantina resembling a large gray tent with sky blue stars, the Azure Star is known for exotic cuisine and entertainment, attracting both locals and visitors. Sindra's Exotic Pets. Run by Sindra and offering a variety of rare animals from different regions, this establishment is ideal for those looking for unique familiars or animal companions. Council Hall and Jail Block. Once known as Aktep Keep, a scandal involving its previous owner, Masin Aktep, has led to its conversion to a jail and council hall. The Doomsayer Stand, a circular dais used by prophets preaching obscure faiths, the more vitriolic of these mad ramblers sometimes come into conflict with the Zephyr Guard. Jangli's Shop, a tent owned by the Jangli brothers selling rare and mysterious items with often exaggerated histories. The Ramps, Stone and timber ramps connecting inner and lower city, known for occasional fatal accidents and illicit exchanges. The Scorpion Sting, a tent offering a variety of poisons run by Jacenia Delib, also acts as a point of contact for the Guild of Assassins. The Temple of Nethys, a pyramid-like building dedicated to Nethys, god of magic, a god who was particularly significant in the history of Osirian. They also offer curatives and magical research services. The Twilight Gate District. Twilight Gate, a section of Katapesh surrounded by outer walls dating back to 3725, reflects the influence of the Pact Master's vision. Parts of this city were a shantytown during the Golden City era, but were repaired and refurbished during Nimar's reign. The Twilight Gate district is now a blend of ancient and modern, and has become a site of tourist attractions, providing both ruins and contemporary structures. The Pathfinder Society Lodge. Amid Cyclopean ruins, the three-tiered Pathfinder Society Lodge stands as a base for the Global Pathfinder Society and headquarters for Katapesh's local Explorers Guild. Overseen by venture captain Aurora Steelbloom, the Lodge houses Pathfinder teams, offering a library with field agents' chapbooks, historical treatises, maps, and rare tomes. Aurora secured the placement of two alum golems for protection, complementing the magical wards safeguarding the building against intrusion. The Red Pyramid this ancient three-sided pyramid from the Golden City era, constructed with red bricks, once entombed a noble-born wizard. Plundered long ago, the pyramid is now a bustling tourist attraction. For a small fee, visitors explore the pyramid, encountering traps set by tomb raiders, skeletons of failed attempts, false burial chambers, and eventually the authentic one. Despite being a well-used establishment, it is rumored that some undiscovered tunnels might still exist. The Grand Alchemist's Tower a towering, crenellated structure, the Grand Alchemist's Tower is the residence of Katapesh's leading alchemist and guildmaster of the Order of Alchemists and Potion Makers. The Ruined Monastery. Originally a temple dedicated to Lamashtu during the Noel Bandit Lord's rule, this stone building adorned with sacrificial engravings now stands abandoned. Despite its state of overall disrepair, the eerie atmosphere does attract visitors, and rumors suggest that they occasionally use the site for dark worship activities. The Sisters of the Quill. 
This two-story building is the dwelling and workplace for dedicated women preserving the written word. Led by Sister Masekwa, they offer translation and reproduction services for a fee of three silver pieces per day. Gladiators Guild Hall. Constructed from bones and hides, this massive guild hall hosts Gladiators Guild members, training in various chambers surrounding the arena. Weekly public pit fights draw gamblers and aspiring fighters, with successful gladiators often advancing to the Grand Colosseum. Dogtown. Dogtown, the most squalid and dilapidated area in Catapesh, serves as a dwelling for the unhoused, ne'er-do-wells, and small-scale business proprietors. Its name is derived from the substantial null population residing here, along with transient workers like prospectors, miners, herbalists, and drug traffickers. The Rabid Dog. Nestled amidst ramshackle warehouses and mining offices east of the Dawngate Road, the Rabid Dog is a perilous tavern owned by Moss Pelt, an old knoll. Primarily catering to knolls, occasional visitors from other ancestries also frequent the establishment. The tavern is notorious, but a skilled knoll guide named Shank Whitelock can often be found here and can lead expeditions across Katapesh and even to distant Sulku. The Charred Meats. Situated on the eastern part of Dogtown, Charred Meats is a repugnant butcher shop run by Chargut, a knoll cleric of Urgothoa. Specializing in repurposing discarded meat portions, Chargut secretly engages in corpse trading, selling various creature remains, especially humanoids, for a considerable price. Ghouls concealed in grey robes guard her business and carry out collection missions when fresh corpses are scarce. The Daystall District For travelers en route from Salku to Katapesh, the Daystalls provide a glimpse of the Grand City through a shanty town of vendor stalls, tents, and kiosks. A precursor to the larger lower city bazaar, the day stalls attract those eager to spend their gold on tempting goods and services. De Toro's Brewery. Run by Anno de Toro, an alchemist-turned-brewer, this extravagant stall offers a variety of ales alongside standard alchemical items. Chiho the Talking Dog. A small stall featuring Chiho, a talking dog cursed from human form, and his companion Torlak. These two put on amusing performances for visitors, but are also seeking a pendant that might lift Chiho's curse. Alcine's Camels. Owned by Alamad Alcine, this stall specializes in breeding and selling Katapeshi camels, known for their suitability as mounts and pack animals in the region. Some camels are trained for battle, and Alamad also provides all necessary gear at standard prices. The Smoke Lady. A black and purple striped tent houses the enigmatic Smoke Lady, a fortune teller who uses illusion magic to project an image composed entirely of swirling smoke. The Sprawl. Among the three communities beyond the city walls, the sprawl is the least likely to captivate visitors. Primarily a residential area, it accommodates local laborers seeking refuge from the chaos beyond the city walls. The population comprises fishermen, carpenters, masons, chandlers, bricklayers, and thatchers, offering their goods at standard rates. Yurig's Repair Shop. Situated along the eastern bank of the River Scorpius south of the Twilight Gate, Yurig's Repair Shop caters to watercraft in need of repair. Owned by Jurg Alshalnar, a retired dwarf wizard and former member of the Red Steel Raiders, the shop performs both mundane and magical repairs. The River Inn. Constructed in 3748, the three-story inn made of river stones and mortar with stout timber beams boasts a magnificent design. Despite changing ownership over the years, it still offers some of the city's best rooms at more affordable rates than most of its competitors. The current owner, Marvius Anquin, is a fastidious but kindly sort. The Castle Clarion Area. Constructed just over a century ago by the retired explorer Oslin Clarion, Castle Clarion stands proudly on a cliff overlooking the inner sea. The castle's bottom features a private set of docks catering to the Clarion family's shipping needs, hosting almost a dozen black-sailed vessels called the Clarion Fleet. The castle consists of slender towers soaring to impressive heights, connected by covered flyway bridges. The sparkling porphyry walls and red slate roofs make Castle Clarion a conspicuous landmark, visible from both land and sea. Lord Clarion, a loyal subject to Katapesh's government, diligently follows the city's laws and ordinances. Beyond the castle itself, the Cliffside Tavern, also perched on the cliff's edge overlooking the inner sea, is a favoured locale for those seeking a quiet place to dine and savour drinks while enjoying the sea air and view. It also famously serves as a romantic rendezvous for couples looking to get out of the hustle and bustle of the main city.